Good morning, everybody. Welcome to day three. Day one and day two, we've had some extremely <clears throat> knowledgeable and diverse presentations varying across geopolitics to economics to policy making to the present geostrategic realities to the basics of UDA. Today we have uh, another dimension, maritime history. And today's speaker, Dr. Radhika Session, ma'am has been associated with us for a while now and I've had multiple interactions with her. And I can assure you that it will be a treat for all of us to listen to ma'am and her perspective. Uh, ma'am, in MRC, normally we don't uh, introduce the speaker. We request the speaker to uh, first uh, talk about themselves and give a, one is about their background and also about the work that they do. So ma'am, I'll request you to kindly introduce yourself and then uh, make your presentation. Um. Thank you, Commander Das. Am I audible? Okay. Thank you, Commander Das, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this. Brief introduction about myself. I, I am that strange animal called a maritime historian, which is, uh, I call it a strange animal because there are so few of us who work on the maritime world, and uh, we are small in number, and often are called niche people. But we have been arguing over the years that maritime is the entry into every field that we want to get into. So my area has been primarily maritime history and my own work has been on trade relations. I work mostly on the period between 1500 and about 1750. So I take what is often called the late medieval, early modern, all of which are terms which are very, very problematic. Therefore, I prefer to use the chronology and say 1500 to about 1750. I've written a couple of books on the subject, and that's about it. I have my thesis was on trade and politics on the Coromandel Coast, and that was where I started my work. And I think that much of an introduction. Oh, I retired as head of the Department of History of uh, Savitri Bhai Phule Pune University. And I am currently visiting faculty at Symbiasis uh, School for Liberal Arts. So I have, uh, well, I've alternately worked my way upwards through the school and downwards through the school because I started off teaching nursery and senior KG, then jumped straight to MA, M full PhD, and now have come back to BA. Maybe next I'll get into the school level teaching. <laughs> okay, now my presentation here is divided into three broad areas. The first is what I call maritime history, which is primarily through the lens of historiography. The second part is the sources that we can use to study this. And the third part goes into the second part of my brief, which is traditional knowledge. How from all of this do we get the knowledge of what to study, where to study, and why do we study? All three questions. Let me start off, therefore, with maritime history. Okay. First question that I would ask of you is, can we study water? Because maritime history is about water. The answer to that has to be a conditional yes and a no. Because water, per se, is often not studied. It's just there, so one does not study it. But it is over water that we have civilizations, it is over water that we have conflicts, and it is over water that we have marginalization. And therefore, every aspect of human life has been through and around water. And therefore, yes, water has a history. So the history of water needs to be studied. The second part is the word maritime itself. Maritime as a word comes from the Latin mer, meaning salt water. But it has come to mean salt water. It doesn't originally mean salt water. It just means water. 
And therefore, when we talk maritime history, we tend to separate into freshwater and saltwater. Again, a problem because, well, lakes would stay fresh, but rivers, which are our major source of fresh water, would definitely meet the salt water. And we have rivers enough which at the mouth, you have one stream which is fresh water and every other stream which is salt water. That's one part of it. The other part is when the fresh water meets the salt water, there is turbulence because of the two kinds, the weights of the two water, which is at another level, your uh, chemical, chemical component of the water itself. So we've got into science straight away over there. But beyond that, our own rivers in India are all such long rivers and cut through so many kinds of land that they carry sand with them. So what happens when the sand gets deposited? Third factor of the maritime world of India is that India is one of the few countries in the world which has the diurnal tides. We have tides that change every six hours. The majority of the world has tides that change every 12 hours. So on the basis of that six hourly change, what do we do? How do we deal with that? And then of course, we've got our monsoons, regular, not so much clockwork regularity these days, but still regular enough. And so starting from the end of May, winds start blowing to and away from the coast. And through June, July, August, September, you can't get to the west coast of India. Then move into September, October, and you've got contrary winds. So you can't blow. You might find yourself going in a totally different direction from that which you planned. And then you have the returning monsoon. So you have a different set of winds. Nevertheless, these are regular. So water has a history. That history is both natural and human. So we need to look at the human element so as to understand the liquid element. And in that process, try to understand what kind of relationships we've had with water over centuries and what we have learned from water. Back in the 17th century, there was this famous letter which was written by the uh, Sultan, the Bijapur Sultan, the Adil Shahi Sultan, to the Ottoman Sultan, which was a complaint which said that a hundred years ago, you sent your great navy to defeat the first Franks who came into our kingdom. 1534, the Ottomans sent the largest navy seen in Asian waters, an armada of 80 ships to attack the island fortress of Diu. That didn't succeed because the Calicut Zamorin's navy did not leave, managed to leave the uh, harbor. Well, only part of the navy left the harbor. The idea was that the Ottoman Sultan would attack from sea, the uh, Calicut Zamorin would attack along the coast and Bahadur Shah would attack from the land. It worked very well, except that part of the Zamorin's navy did not come out. Uh, Bahadur Shah was attacked by Humayu and so withdrew his troops and the Portuguese who were within what we would today call an aims ace of disaster managed to recoup their losses and that ended it. But the Bijapur Sultan went back to that and said, we had, you sent an army. Is it not time that we gathered our forces again to oppose the Franks? Because now there are two more groups of Franks who have come in, who claim that they are lords of the sea. How can they be lords of that which is not fixed? The sea is common to all. And that's where we start our maritime history with the idea of the sea being common to all. That water cannot be anchored. You can anchor in water, but water itself cannot be anchored. That's our starting point for the study of maritime history. And so back to the first question, can we study water? Yes, we can study water in multiple ways. What we need to find out is how do we study the water? What, where are we putting our anchor? It is not a question of whether there are anchors, it is our anchor and what we are anchoring it to, much more than anything else. Uh, next question is how do we study it? And that unfortunately gives us a very, very complicated answer. 
because there are so many ways and so many directions and like water itself goes off in so many different ways. I mean, we've seen the waves themselves and we've seen the multiple directions of the waves and we've also seen water, the rivers and the ways they flood. It goes in so many directions. Which direction are we going to see? So from the point of view of convenience, what we end up doing is we look at the way water has been written about. And that gives us historiography. So the answer to how do we study maritime history is first of all historiography. Technically, historiography means the history of history writing because history has been written. We add to it with a whole lot of other things, but yes, history has primarily been written. And it is a crucial factor. And it is something where we have a, a long tradition which was negated in colonial times. And we have the entire recasting of India's past through colonial literature. And colonial historiography has given us two, well, unfortunately received truths, which are truths that were invented in the 19th century and have come to be accepted as the gospel truth. And I'm using the word gospel truth here very, very designedly. It has been taken as unchallengeable. The first is that India's engagement with the sea through colonial historiography has at best been sidelined, at worst ignored altogether. The British told us that we had no engagement with the sea, that the merchants were the third caste and therefore what they did was totally ignored by the land-based powers. And therefore, the sea was just there. We didn't have. How with 1,000 kilometers of uh, coastline and a peninsula which juts into the Indian Ocean, and even more, a landmass to which you have to come with the monsoon winds. And remember that the age of steam is a very recent one. Prior to that was always just the age of sail. The age of sail, given that whatever direction you sailed in, you landed somewhere on the coast of India. How can you ignore it? How do people ignore it? Perhaps the first challenge to this kind of thinking came from two historians. One being, unfortunately, not Sardar K. M. Panikar, but actually Ashin Das Gupta and an Australian historian, Michael Naylor Pearson. Ashin Das Gupta looked at what Sardar Panikar had written about the Vasco da Gama epoch. And he said, yes, it was an epoch. Only problem is we don't know what that epoch marked. It didn't mark anything at all. So Ashin Das Gupta, well, I will say that many of us who work in, we started our work in maritime history thanks to listening and being taught by Ashin Das Gupta. So he was the one who really started maritime history in India from an Indian perspective. These were in the 1970s. Michael Pearson went one step further, and he said that how far inland should you go to get away from the smell of the sea? And his answer in India was nowhere. Because it is not possible to get away from the smell or the sense of the sea, however far you go. There are two examples that bolster this. One is a text written in Madhya Pradesh in the 14th century. It is a text in Sanskrit. It is called the Yukti Kalpataru. And is a text which is about all kinds of technical details. It has one section which is on shipbuilding. And Madhya Pradesh is geographically the center of India, as far from the sea in every direction as it is possible to get. Nevertheless, the text on... Uh, this is a text which tells you what kind of wood is to be used for what kind of craft. So it is not to do with the, the sea itself. It is to do with the craft that goes into the sea. So it gives you a classification of the wood and says, this wood is too light. Use it only on the inland streams. This wood is too heavy. Don't use it on the inland. Use it only in deep sea. This wood is medium wood. Use it in coastal navigation. So it gives you a an entire history of what kind of wood is to be used. And it says, if you want to do a longer, alternate these two kinds of wood. So you've got an entire history of shipbuilding from a text in there. 
And the other, this is the example with which, which Pearson used. He says, think about how Hyderabad in the 18th century and 19th century became famous for pearls. Pearls are supposed to be from the sea and they became famous for cultured pearls, but it is the pearl that becomes the symbol of the Nizami. So he says, isn't that also a symbol of the sea? That is a landlocked kingdom where he has no access to the sea in any direction and he celebrates the past by cultivating pearls. He says, these, these are your concrete examples of the whiff of ozone, is what he called it. The second part of, again, colonial historiography is this wonderful thing that everybody accepts, which is the loss of purity by crossing the oceans. That Indians never went abroad, went over the sea, because it meant a loss of caste. Caste and the loss of caste is important to those who claim purity. It cannot be of importance when you're balancing purity of blood against livelihood. And when livelihood is the priority, then you go anywhere and do anything for livelihood. Here again, an example to which I was directed by Michael Pearson, which is a letter of uh, a Portuguese. Uh, Portuguese had this very good system for us historians because it meant there's a whole lot of records being generated. Every captain at the end of a voyage of the Portuguese ships had to file a report in Goa, which was then written at the, put together at the end of the year into a whole series, and the year's report was sent to Lisbon. So you have one copy of the report in Goa and one copy in Lisbon. So in that he, and everything is detailed. It's like the ship's log. So it says, on this day we saw this, on this day we saw this. There's a whole lot of things. And in that, one of the captains has written that uh, outside of Aden, uh, we came across an Indian ship that was foundering. The uh, keel had been, had, was barnacled and therefore uh, the ship was due to sink. We managed to take all the goods and the uh, people off the ship and left, left it to drift and sink. When the, uh, we took the people on board, we discovered that one of them was a Brahmin. So we informed the Brahmin that we had only mutton and beef on board and no vegetables at all. And the Brahmin said that in the interests of staying alive, he would eat anything and he would do prashchit for it once he got back home. I think that's an eminently practical way of dealing with things. <laughs> and prashchit always exists. Vapas ja ke prashchit karenge. Abhi konsi jaldi padi hai? Zinda to rahe prashchit karne ke liye. This is the logic that exists. 17th century, we have a French traveler who was in Venice. And in Venice, he says, I met, as is always the case, merchants from India, Armenia, Turkey, who are far more organized than those whom we have in Europe. They, they are the people from whom our French merchants need to take lessons. What were they doing in Venice if they were not allowed to cross the seas? And they did go by sea. It isn't the land route. So this is yet another of these, uh, I guess I would call them the colonial era shibboleths, which have become received truth. These are fanciful tales. Unfortunately, again, like I said, we take this as the truth without going beyond colonial rewriting of India's past to think about what actually the past was about. And so, well, maybe I'll quote one more of the colonial era writers, Rudyard Kipling. Probably, Rudyard Kipling. East is east and west is west and never the twain shall meet. And we've got proof enough that the twain met any number of times. But we ignore those proofs. And so we need to go back to the sources. And here, far from the truth being that Indian didn't write history. We wrote history of a different kind from what the Europeans wrote. So we have sources, and a great number of them. Let me start with perhaps the easiest to grasp, which is the European records of their interactions with India. The Portuguese came first. They have this voluminous collection 
which is all compiled into a group called the Records of the Estado de India, the Records of the Portuguese Estate of India, which are almost entirely in Goa. In fact, it's a good thing that uh, in good bureaucratic fashion, they kept multiple copies. Because in the 1770s, when there was the earthquake and the great fire in Lisbon, all the records that had been preserved in Lisbon along with the city itself were destroyed. And so the copies are those which are in Goa. It is from Goa that they've gone into Lisbon now. So it is the Goa records. Within that, there is a section which is called the Ultramarine, which is literally the records of the sea engagements. Every single detail is mentioned including things like how they built a dock, how much they paid to each of the merchants, what is the cost of the bricks in India. If one wants to do a wage history of India, one can't do better than the Portuguese and the Dutch records because they give you the details of this is the payment that is made in this sultanate, this is the payment made in this kingdom, this is the Nayak's kingdom. Every possible detail is listed. And there is a phenomenal record over there. Linked to all of this is a detailed record of what is cultivated where, what is traded in, how much is traded. So for instance, we know that, um, thanks to those records, we know that Basrur on the west coast of India was the major export center for rice, which went in Indian ships to Madagascar Later on, the Dutch complain about it because say that they say that the Basrur port and its export of rice feeds the pirates on the coast of Madagascar. And therefore, it is a problem. We need to get to Basrur. They never manage it. Then there is the port of Bankapur, a little further north, which says that is the best port for the import of horses. They also give a reason. They say that at Bankapur, the surf is not so high. And therefore, the horses can be landed safely. Here's your ecological history. It's a history of the coast, which we do not look at in any other fashion. Move into the Dutch records, and we have, again, phenomenal detail. In this, uh, the Dutch were more on the east coast of India. So if we go inwards from Maslipatna, then these are the weaving villages. These are the weaving castes. This is the kind of cotton that they grow. This is the cotton that is brought in. These are the people who bring in the cotton, and this is the way it is exported. So you've got that entire range of the cotton history there. Then there is uh, the English records who say that looms need to be redone in order to uh, make the Coromandel weaver make cloth after the Bengal fashion. And so the carpenters who are involved in reshaping the looms, the differences between the Bengal method of cloth and the Coromandel method of cloth, every item is there. This is a technological history. This is a craft history. This is a weaving history. This is a socio-economic history of India, all linked to the maritime world, because every bit of this is through trade. And so maritime is primarily looked at through the lens of trade. It is one of our easiest ways to get into the maritime world and into the details of how to handle that maritime world. Then let me therefore move into the last section, which is traditional knowledge. That is where perhaps the least work has been done and perhaps where the maximum work can be done. The first thing to be remembered over here is that traditional knowledge cannot be separated between land and sea. Knowledge is knowledge. It might span worlds, but it does not restrict itself to either the land or the sea. The knowledge of one is moved into the other. The knowledge of one, the other is utilized in one. So there is a constant dynamic exchange between knowledge and practice. This is something that I have been saying for many, many, many years, which is that the separation of science and technology is a European Renaissance-inspired separation. Historically, there has been no separation between science and technology. Technology was science, and science was technology. Laboratory science is a development of the post-17th century world. It is a development that makes phenomenal sense in Europe 
it does not make sense in the older civilizations of the world, which is Asia and Africa. So the two are intertwined. Let me give one uh, concrete example of this. When the British took over India, they declared that uh, Indians had no sense of technology because they used the same kind, they had used the same kind of plow for the past 2,000 years that they knew of. And they argued that the plow that we used was a very light plow, which was not enough for cultivation, which is why India was agriculturally poor. How they came to the conclusion of India being agriculturally poor is something that we still need to think about, which is a different because they came in and they transformed. But they introduced the heavy plow in India because they said the heavy plow that we use in Europe is the best possible. That was the worst thing that they did to India's agriculture because the heavy plow on India's fertile soil went too deep into the ground and denuded the soil of its natural ingredients. We needed the light plow because ours is not the snow, snow impacted heavy soil which needs to be broken up every time. Ours is a monsoon soil which you have to just turn over, which you do not have to dig too deep. In the process of introducing the heavy plow, they ruined our agriculture. Then traditionally Indian agriculture has always been about one crop, about what is called the two crop rotation, not the two field rotation, the two crop rotation, where we had one on the ridges and one on the furrows. Received wisdom, things like there is, there is a text of the seventh century, which is called the Krishi, Gran, uh, Krishi Gyana, the Krishi Gyan, Gyana Sutra which talks about how one has to go into cultivation, particularly of rice. And it talks about how rice will denude the soil after a few years, and therefore you need to balance it out with beetroot. So you've got beetroot, you've got your balancing of the ingredients. One takes out, the other replaces. Post 17th century, post 16th century, when French beans came in, they discovered that French beans and gavar would replenish nitrogen, apparently. So you would be able to tell me much more about this than anybody else. But it would replenish the nitrogen and the phosphates. The British replaced, the, replaced this with plantation farming, where you had the same crop in both the ridge and the furrow. End result, the soil was leached. Every natural ingredient in the soil was lost. And particularly with indigo, which is what happened with Bengal and Bihar. Indigo plantations across Bengal and Bihar have ruined the soil to such an extent that it has taken 70 years. Part of the effect of that is the arsenic that we find in the Midnapur area because it affected the groundwater. So we've got arsenic going in. These kinds of issues came in with the later. This is why I said there is no difference between the practice and the knowledge, technology and science. The science of balancing nutrients, the technology which allowed you to go into this kind of balance, and the practice of centuries which gave you this knowledge were all put together. This is where traditional knowledge begins, in understanding that there is a balance, and that balance was maybe not understood in theoretical terms, but it was understood in practical terms, which to many more makes more of the sense. What we had therefore was what is today beginning to be called community science, that it was a scientific engagement of the community itself with the practices of science, never mind if the theory took a very long time to catch up with the practice, the practice was good enough. Good enough. It is here that traditional knowledge begins. Let me go to the next area of traditional knowledge. And here, I'll go back to the coast. This, perhaps our most important dimension of the coastal, of the uh, blue water, green water, all, all of it, whether it's deep sea, coastal, or in the intermediate zones. One thing that you need is ships. You cannot do without ships. And so the Yukti Kalpataru, which tells you what kind of wood to be used for what kind of ship. By and large, we have mention in the records of three kinds of ships, broadly. These come to be much more well-known in later times. 
what they were called the Galivat, later called the Galbat, the Gurav, these are mostly on the west coast of India. These become part of Kanhuji Angri's uh, navy. So the Gurav and the Galbat. The Galbat was actually a merchant cargo ship. The Gurav was a warship. With Kanhuji Angri, it was reversed. So the Gurav becomes the merchant ship and the Galbat becomes the fast oared or twin-masted ship that could be used for warfare. So that becomes the warship, the Galbat. On the east coast, there are two which are most important. One is the Katamaran, the other is the Malay Prahu, which comes to be in English called the Prahu. Both are ships which are geared to the surf of the Bay of Bengal. Because the Bay of Bengal has this very, very high surf because of the huge continental shelf, the surf of the Bay of Bengal is very erratic and it has multiple currents in between. Also, of certain sections of the coast, there is a break in the continental shelf. So you go a certain distance out, then there is a trench, and then you get that level ground again. Because of that, your currents are contrary. And because the currents are contrary, your surf is going to be very high. By and large, the ports of the west, of the east coast of India, do not have good harbors. All are open to the sea. You have only one real natural harbor on the east coast of India, and that is Vishakapatnam, which up to the 17th, end of the 17th century, was not important at all. All the important ports were those which were open to the sea. Masulipatnam, which was perhaps the worst of the ports, but the most important of the ports. Masulipatnam ends at a sandbar. So goods have to be unladen in the high sea, taken by headload across the sandbar and have to be carried in in such a way that they avoid the swamp which is on both sides because the delta is also swampy land. So you have to avoid all of that. So it is the worst possible. The Golconda rulers, of course, made sure that they got every bit of income. They built one nice narrow bridge from the sandbank to the city. And uh, they made this bridge wide enough for only one cart to cross in one direction at one time. So everybody who went was stopped at the customs gate at the entrance to the city. They made sure of their money. Same thing, it's called the, uh, it's often called the Mubarak Bandar because it was the most important port of the Golconda. In the same way, Surat. Surat was the Bandar Mubarak of the uh, Mughals the great port, the worst. Surat and Masli Bhatnam match in terms of horrible anchorages. Surat, well, the Krishna River ends at the sandbanks you cannot go across. Narmada has multiple sandbanks all along, and the river gets shallower and shallower, so that as you go nearer to Surat, you get less draft for ships. So ships cannot sail into the river at all. The mouth has shifting uh, sand shoals, so you cannot go in very easily. Everything had to be unladen at Swali, which is again an open port, which is 24 kilometers uh, northwestwards on the open coast. Goods had to be transshipped there and brought by land to Surat and then taken across the river in ferry boats. But what do you have over here? You have the knowledge of ferries, you have the knowledge of the surf, you have the knowledge of the kinds of ships required to deal with the surf, you have the knowledge of where anchoring can happen, you have also the knowledge of the navigation and the maneuverability of certain kinds of boats. Now the catamaran today is your double hulled boat with a plank across. It comes from the Tamil word Maram, two logs tied together with a bar in the middle. Now, that gives you your balance. And because it is double hulled, it goes across the surf very easily. So it is very difficult to capsize. I mean, you have to try very hard to capsize a catamaran, which is why it's the boat used for yacht raising these days, because it is, it's speedy and it skims over the surface. 
Now, if you add it, add to it the uh, sale, particularly if you have the Latin sale, then it is so much easier to maneuver. So the Latin sale, which did not exist in the Mediterranean and the Atlantic world, is an invention of the Indian Ocean world. The Latin sale comes in here. Yet another practical dimension of knowledge. Now, the Latin sale is your triangular sale, which is also fairly free moving. So it swings around with the breeze and it will catch every bit of breeze that goes around. We have sculptures showing the Latin sale in Borobudur, in Angkor Wat, all across. The Prahu, the Malay boat, is something which can be uh, maneuvered both ways. I mean, it's got a slightly curved prow and a broader beam with the results. So it's, a, it's not exactly a round boat, but it's a semicircular kind of a boat. Because of the rounded beam, it can be maneuvered, uh, well, instead of prow first, it is stern first can come in, which means that there is greater stability. And the prow can be made into a double hulled or and a double decked version. So it can be used for cargo. Then there are the smaller ships, what comes into the British Navy as the ketch. We don't know the origin of the word ketch, but it is definitely something which is made in the east coast of India, probably at a shipyard called Narsapur Peta. It is a long, narrowish boat, which, is, which has a very deep draft and very high curving ends. And it can be both sail and oar. So it allows for both coastal and deep sea navigation. We've got this phenomenal history of shipbuilding that comes up from these sources. And I'm not even, I've looked, I've given what I've talked about just now is from just three sources. The Yukti uh, some of the accounts of the Dutch, and one English record by Thomas Bowery, a geographical account of the countries around the Bay of Bengal. There are any number of others. There is a description in 1800 of the coracal boats of the Kaveri River, the round boats, which says are very difficult. And he very clearly says that these you will not find outside the Deccan because these are geared to the streams that run at tremendous speed in the higher ranges of the hills. So your coracal boats you'll find on the Tunghabhadra up to Hampi, in Karnataka up to the Hoganakal Falls, and you'll find them uh, in the Rajapur, in the Jaitapur Creek. But you, they will not go into the ocean because they don't handle the ocean. So these are your river boats and your sea boats. All of it is there. That's one dimension of the entire technology that we have. Linked to all of this is the second and, to my mind, the much more important aspect of traditional knowledge, which is that of sailing and therefore of the kinds of wind, water, and current that exists. There was an experiment carried out, I think, in the 1950s, where they looked at uh, putting a bottle into the water on the eastern side of Aden port. Gujarati sailors had long said that if you left from the eastern end of Aden port, then in 21 days, you would make landfall at Daman. So they tried that. And they'd said that if you follow the current properly, then it will take 21 days, but you must remember that the current moves in these particular latitudes only. The latitudes that they mentioned when triangulated with a modern map worked out perfectly, but it was not commonly known. So they said, and their method of navigation was, when you leave the coast of Aden, you must leave at sunrise when the sun is at a 45 degree angle in front of the boat. So you're looking at moving this way and a 45 degree angle there. It says when you end the day, 
the sun must be setting at a 45 degree angle to the west of the boat. That is how you know that you are on the right line. Here is mathematics, practical mathematics. I mean, they didn't tell us, they didn't say 45 degree. They said, um, apparently what they said was, haat agar sidha karoge, to aisa hoga. Yaha dhoop hai, to aisa. To hum jo hai, wo suraj ki or, sham ko, or ye ungli jo hai, wo suraj ki or. That's your 45 degree angle straight out. You don't need anything more than that. If you keep it like this, that's your 45 degree angle. That's what they were planning. Here is your practical mathematics. They don't care about anything else. Your pro you keep your protractors. We know how to do it with our fingers. This is, again, aspects of traditional knowledge. Then there is another one which says that if you leave the port of Basra at the mouth of the uh, Persian Gulf, if you leave on Navroz Day, which is the Parsi New Year Day, then you will come to Sanjan exactly 31 days later. That was tried out. It happened in 31 days. If you leave the coast of Surat after the ship has come in, if you leave the coast of Sanjan on the 35th day, then you will get back to Basra at the end of 42 days because your return journey is there. Yet another one which said that, if you are sailing away from the coast of India, then ships must leave the coast of Malabar no later than May 5th. They must leave the Konkan coast no later than May 10th. And they must leave the Gujarat coast latest by the 20th of May. If they do not leave by those times, then they will not get the winds to take them to their destination. That's when your monsoon winds are still contrary. That's when, so May 1st, by May 1st, we know what the Malabar coast is like. So leave. And then something which was corroborated for us when we went to Maslipatnam was we'd gone there in uh, September, the beginning of September. At which time, no, sorry, we'd gone there at the beginning of May. At which time all the uh, smaller, the fishing boats were all maneuvering their boats so that they were... Um, well, easiest example is uh, parking on the roads. Instead of um, parallel parking, they were doing it as horizontal parking. So they were all perpendicular to the coast. When we asked why, they actually looked very disgusted with the questions because I'm sure they thought they were very, we were asking very stupid questions. And they said, uh, the ships will come from the east coast, from the west coast, no? Barish are wali hai. Unke liye to jagha banani hai. So this is a movement which continues till today. And there is, and so he said, doesn't it affect you? She says, no. Idhar jo hai, aisa jata hai na, coast hamara. To yaha hume shelter mil jayega. So here's a knowledge, a practical knowledge. And when we asked them for a map, they said, wo tum log sab halo. Hame kya lena hai usse? And this kind of a day-to-day -day knowledge is something which is phenomenal. The same thing happened with the tsunami, which hit the coast of Nagapattinam, as we all know, particularly. And some of the survivors of the tsunami, particularly the older ones, had been taken to shelter to the city of Madurai. Some of them were met. Their records have been, their testimony has been taken down. And a large number of them from one of the uh, smaller villages just near, uh, right on the coast near Nagapattinam said that, we, in our family, in our village, all the youngsters have died because they did not listen to us when we told them that the color of the water had changed and there was a great flood coming. So when we asked them, what does the color of the water mean? They said, we don't, we can't describe it. But when that color happens, we know that something has happened in Kadaram, Keda. Something underwater has happened in Kadaram, Keda, and the great wave will hit us, which is exactly what the tsunami was. It was an earthquake off the coast of Keda, which hit here. Inscriptions, pictures of Harappan seals show us something that are still used, what are called the Dishakakas, the direction-finding birds. 
seals of the Harappan period give us the direction finding birds. Hero stones all along the Konkan coast give us direction finding birds. The idea that birds could be kept on board and the birds could be set loose, they would fly in the direction of the wind towards land. If they came back, land was not near, you needed to go nearer. If they did not come back, land was near enough to be a day's flying journey away. So you follow. Yet another out of a disaster only, I don't know if any of you remember, but I think it was in, uh, about 10 years ago, a group of college students were taken on a school, on a college trip to Alibag. This was uh, about 24 of them. 12 of them drowned in the coast of Alibag. And it was discovered that they had been told not to go to a particular part of the beach because they were told that the sea rushes in over here and there is a very strong undertow. You won't be able to keep your balance. You'll be pulled out to sea. That was exactly what happened. How did they know that the undertow happened right there under the sea? Again, centuries of knowledge. This is what is meant by traditional knowledge. And it is this that we need to really think about a lot more. I could go on a lot more about this because there's a whole lot of this. But I will link this to another set of sources, which is now the inscriptions. Inscriptions tell us a lot about the kinds of engagement. There is, for instance, the famous story of um, one of the rulers of the uh, Malabar coast who decided to go on a pilgrimage to Somnath. And um, he said he constructed, the first year the inscription says that he tried this for three years but managed to do it only after the third year. Because in the first year he consulted the astrologers who told him a good day. But the ship's master told him that that was the worst possible day because the ship's, the contrary winds had begun. The second time he set out, he managed to get as far as Mangalore, but the ship was calmed, becalmed there because the winds had suddenly stopped. And the inscription says, something which often happens just before the monsoon sets in. There is a period of intense heat. Actually, the inscription also says that this is the time of the Agni Nakshatra. When the winds will not blow very strongly, they will be weak, fitful winds. And so you will feel the heat more. And so he turned back. And the third year, there was an unexpected cyclone, so he turned back. So in the fourth year, he went, he did his pilgrimage, and then he came back and he said that he would write the record of all that he had done. And by the third year, he had sacked all his astrologers because he said that the fishermen gave him a better sense of what to do and how to go. These are inscriptions. This is, this is regarded as a story. It isn't a story. It's a factual account of the engagement with the coastal waters and the movement along the coast. We have the reverse in a different set of inscriptions where we have uh, on the, for the Arab sailors, the coast of India was called the coast of the Rashtrakutas because they knew the west coast of India and the Rashtrakutas controlled every inch of the coast. And they said that, be careful because they know how to collect the money even from ships that have been far out at sea. Further back from uh, Rashtrakutas, we go into the Chalukyas, who are central Deccan, Karnataka, and Pulukeshan launches an expedition against what he calls the great island of Puri, which is Elephanta. And having launched an attack on Puri, he captures it and he says that, in lovely fanciful language like all inscriptions, it says, I have now tied the girdle of the earth around my waist because with my capture of Puri, I have access to, uh, effectively says I have access to all the trade that comes into the Arabian Sea. And so I can control everything. Still further back, Periplus of the Erythrean Sea talks about how the Kshatrapas and the Chalukyas of Kalyani were busy fighting over uh, the port of Kalyan because they wanted, uh, one group wanted the Roman ships to come into Kalyan, the others wanted them to come to Sopara. Both are today uh, suburbs of Bombay. 
And if you look at those creeks, you would wonder how ships ever came in because they are just disgustingly dirty nalas now. But they were creeks and there is a conflict over that. So when we look at the maritime world, we need to look at the ways in which the inscriptions, the royal records define the collection of revenue. Remember that state systems are always concerned with revenue collection. And so if we look at the sources of revenue, if we look at the problems about the sources of revenue, particularly in the peninsula, we get access to the marine world, the interface of the marine with the landed worlds, and the state as an element in all of these areas. I think I will stop there for now, and we would take questions. <laughs> I'll link the Brahmaputra actually to a whole lot of the other rivers as well. Now, the northern Bay of Bengal is a very, very uh, fluvial kind of a area. And there are three main river systems that feed into the, no the northern Bay. The Brahmaputra, Tista, and the Ganga. These are your three. The point of the confluence of the Brahmaputra and the Tisa is one of extreme turbulence, even today, because the Tisa is a cutting river and the Brahmaputra is an immensely fast moving river. Looks nice and calm on the surface. And when you look at it a little more closely, you realize how fast the water is actually moving. As rivers that traverse a whole lot of mountainous areas, they are at one at the same time tidal, especially the Brahmaputra, as well as singular. And so in the Tista, much more than in the Brahmaputra, you have the whirlpools that come up at the points where they come together. The Brahmaputra is also marked by immensity of breadth. So we have what are called the Charchapuris all along. That is the islands around there. These islands are both fixed and non-fixed in that they would probably be there at the end of the monsoon, but they might not. So with the Brahmaputra, you have a, a sense of a community which is very, very aquaterrestrial. The Brahmaputra lends itself to this world which is both water and land at one at the same time. And that is a world which is one which is fluid and fixed, permanent and impermanent, long-lasting and temporary, all at the same time. So engagement with the Brahmaputra necessarily has to be at multiple levels and it has to be at community levels because it is a river which cannot be understood from the outside. It is a river system which has to be understood through the local knowledge, what we would call the community science once again. They are the ones who would be able to tell you at what time it would be all right to cross at what part of the Brahmaputra. And this is not localized knowledge. It would be knowledge that is upstream and downstream. So the Brahmaputra perhaps needs to be looked at much more. In fact, the entire Brahmaputra, uh, Tista, Ganga combined needs to be looked at from the lens of what is called upstream and downstream linkages. What happens upstream? What has happened upstream will affect that which is happening downstream. And that is carried on, uh, I think, uh, Herman has had this in his Siddhartha where he says the river moves on. But when the river moves on, it leaves traces. And these traces are marked by the communities that live on and by the water. Maritime history is a study of what is on the water, what is off the water, and what is in the water. For the Brahmaputra, we need to look at all three. Off, on, in. This is the way one needs to study the Brahmaputra. It would possibly be equally applicable to the Krishna, which is another very, very dangerous river. Post the Nagarjan Sagar, the dam over there, it's a little less fierce than it used to be, but it is definitely a problem. Uh, the Tunghabhadra 
is a shorter river, a faster river, but one which is, um, uh, it can be, it can't be tamed, no river can be tamed, but it can be understood on a more localized level than the Brahmaputra or the Tista. Both these give you your uh, mountains, hills, plains, coast. Each of this is a separate ecological, environmental, and fluid system. Each needs to be understood both as a complete and as segmented. The segmented dimensions have been looked at from the point of view of water resources. But there is the entire history of the river and the engagement with the river system. And the river systems give you, for the Brahmaputra, the hills to the north, the plain through which it runs, and the coast at the bottom. Three distinct geographical areas, all of which need to be engaged with at one and the same time in order to be able to get. The Tista gives you a cutting river, which means it's carrying down a lot of silt. When that silt hits the uh, point at which it meets the Brahmaputra, what happens to all that silt? Where is it dropped? Does that create fresh islands or is it moved out? I mean, we talk of dredging. That's going to ruin the system altogether because that is something which goes into the sea. If you dredge over there, you're ruining the Sundarbans and the mangrove. Your entire delicate ecological structure of the mangroves is ruined if you're dredging over there. And dredging is not a solution. So, which is possibly actually the last point that I would, <laughs> that we need to look at water as part of the broader environmental ecological sphere and the ecosystem of the world. Sangam literature back in the third century BC, BCE talked of the Tinai, the five ecozones of the Tamil area which is the uh, fertile lands along the river, the uh, coasts, the lower slopes of the foothills, the uh, barren lands, and the higher slopes of the mountains. And it says each has, well, it's poetry, so it's got an emotion attached to it, but it each has a particular kind of occupational structure. And what's most interesting is, is the connection that they make between the coast and the hills because they say where the water rises and where the water ends. That's where. Where the water rises is where the trees are cut, which will be floated down the water in order to hit the coast, where over the time of its immersion in the water, it will have become seasoned to be able to cut and shape into boats, which they take. And then the other which says that the smaller bits of wood which come faster down the river can be used to make the spears that they use for fishing along the coast. So you've got spear fishing there, you've got here. There's a whole lot in the Sangam poetry which talks of all of this. So our riverine systems, in fact, over here, I would probably go on to the word that is used in Sanskrit. The word is invariably sagara. We've got used to talking of sagara as sagara. But the way in which the Sanskrit texts talk of Sagara gives us just a body of water. Samundara is the word that they use for the ocean. Sagara is any large body of water, which is often unmanageable, but which we try to manage. So, Himkund Sagar, Manasarovar Sagar, Sarovar is different. A Sagara is different. Himkund Sagar, Nagarjuna Sagar, Himkund Sagar. And we've got Chalukya inscriptions talking about building a sagar. We've got the Chola inscriptions talking about the sagar. But much more in the Chola inscription, it is Kadal, the coast. And earlier literature, the coast, the water that kills, the water that saves, the water that preserves, and the water that damages. This is something that we need to remember when we're talking about water of any kind, whether riverine or oceanic. That water is the most unmanageable force in nature. And therefore, it needs to be understood in order to be dealt with, to be engaged with. You can't deal with water, you engage with water.
can't get better than that in any case any questions or any yeah. good morning ma'am rishikesh wag is my name uh, ma'am uh, can you please uh, tell the a little louder please <laughs> Uh, ma'am can you please uh, refer to that literature in which sang in sangam literature which talked about five zones i could not get the name okay it's there in all the poetry it's called tinai t i n a i and it is um, if you want the tamil names it is nadal marudam uh, kurinji palai and mullai these are your five zones the nadal is the rich land along the rivers which has uh, agriculture the marudam is the salty is the sandy and salty land along the coast where you have fishing uh coconut production and uh, trade the uh, kurinji is the lower slopes of the hills where you have uh, goat um, cattle and goat rearing and fruit farming the palar is the barren rocky areas which connect the different zones through which the trade routes pass and the uh, mullai is the higher slopes of the hills where you have hunting gathering but you also have the chieftains who protect or uh, attack the passes across the mountains you will find this in uh, many of the poetry which is in that collection known as attutohai the uh, eight anthologies you will find these connections there thank you ma'am and ma'am uh, you said that uh... ancient sailors used to use birds in their uh, in their journey so were they seagulls we don't know the uh, term that is used is dishakaka um the direction finding crow kaka is the tamil word for crow and tamil seems to have been the language which was used for much of this thing we know that Uh, even today in the lakshadweep islands among the tandels the the local boatmen they still use many of the tamil uh, terms for measurement for instance the tamil word for measurement was um, the angle was um, okay uh, one standard form of navigation has always been along the with reference to orion's belt the constellation because that gives you sirius and sirius gives you uh, the pole star so that in the tamil literature as well as in lakshadweep is called rudra shiva so the it's drawn out as rudra shiva and it is given as a marker and it says that when you're looking at rudra shiva there is um, in the belt it says if you stand here and you think the angle is of two fingers width and they call it the viral and if you it is two fingers width this way then you must remember that this points downwards and in a straight line from here you will find sirius and it's a straight line up from there so it is this v angle will give you the angle of the pole star is that accurate <laughs> but this this is what they have said so tamil seems to have been one of the earliest languages 10th century um, al masudi says that the viral measurements that the sailors use is 1 degree off and therefore they replace it which was with what they call the kisa which is uh, exactly the same as the modern degrees and and uh, i don't know like is it right or not but i read somewhere that uh, in uh, like red indians in uh, north america they used to have a tattoo on their hand and they used to navigate on the basis of that tattoo so is it it depends on there is one tribe that did it uh the it is the iroquois in canada which did it on the basis of the tattoo on the back of the hand but i don't know of any of the specifically usa tribes that done it i know that the iroquois used to is said to have done it the problem is so much of the iroquois was wiped out in by the disease and by the british and the french that much of that knowledge is totally lost to us so we don't know thank you so much you are so absolutely right in fact uh, well, since i served in latin america for many years they have a long history of uh, navigation mm. of their own mm. yes they used to navigate the pacific coast mm. on this side and the atlantic coast on the other side and they in fact when i was there they were trying to recreate 
those journeys in reed boats <laughs> not really our uh, wood plank mm. uh, boats mm. so we saw with our own eyes you know they cons- building those reed boats because reed boats had a certain uh, natural uh, capacity of flexibility mm. uh, because when you are talking about turbulence mm. in the sea now uh, more fixed the structure more difficult to negotiate the turbulence correct and more flexible the structure easier to negotiate mm-hmm. that and in fact if i remember correctly now you know long time this mm-hmm. i'm talking of something something about 30 years ago uh, i don't know where my memory will serve me right or not it was they were building that boat to go across the pacific into the now we see you know these uh, south pacific islands mm-hmm. because that is what they used to negotiate in fact and again they had wonderful knowledge of seasons in fact whenever i talk i have in fact last two days i have used uh, uh, the sal nino phenomena mm. uh, mm-hmm. to explain mm. what we are looking at in terms of global warming mm. uh, they would look at the color of the sea mm. and tell you that they are now the now el nino is setting in mm. so if you have to prepare prepare now and from that color setting in the impact of el nino will take several months which means you have time to prepare mm-hmm. right and similarly la nina mm-hmm. for example if the floods are coming you must know that you must know that yes so they they have a long you know, i am very you know sad that you know that history was completely wiped out by uh, these colonial uh, invaders yes. colonization has ruined the world yes. in a whole lot of because ways. they <laughs> they came with a very different idea of life you know that was the reason uh, because they thought but these are two different ways of thinking in fact uh, so is the uh, so is the for example the eastern way of thinking so our way of thinking is very different so as a result they could not comprehend what was happening right and as a result though they were post renaissance science scientific thinking they were not able to integrate the traditional knowledge with science and technology they thought this is a break so this is something different we are different i personally think no time for us are we trying to converge the traditional knowledge with technology now so the validation of traditional knowledge through technology uh will really open a completely new way of thing, looking at history how to how to bring history into into future in fact yes so my own worry is that we are not doing it you know not doing it in any traditional knowledge be it navigation or even say ayurveda and all that stuff or yoga and all that we are not really converging the two there is a certain bit of an arrogance on both sides either we blindly accept or blindly reject both sides right so there is no dialogue in fact this dialogue is missing and if this dialogue doesn't take place then my worry is that the in my view i may be entirely wrong in fact you know uh, the finish line technology will will reach earlier than the tradition and we will lose in the process a lot of knowledge yes i fully agree with you sir because there is a, a disconnect and that disconnect is like you said it's blindness on both sides and uh, and it's a, and yes you use the correct word arrogance it's this thing so you either talk of what parampara as being uh, set in stone which it can't be <laughs> it's or you talk of uh, it would have to become part of parampara and it would have to. i have in fact met recently a uh, well as somebody who's trying to reclaim community science and he has uh, built with the um, you know these small town hotels which are now trying to build up the tourist crowd so he's built this small uh, washing machine which is a tabletop which will take in eight bed sheets at a time for a small hotel and he's got the people in the community to come together it's built out of scrap it's working brilliantly now that's community science it's also waste management it's also ecological and because it's a small load he's cut down he's showed them how to use less water and how to use less soap same thing for example in in traditional architecture correct right 
now we are all talking about sustainable development mm. and the traditional knowledge would help achieve those goals along with technology i am not divorcing one from the other yes for instance again in europe now they have these extreme weathers uh, cold and hot mm -hmm. so well, hot is not extreme but cold is now they have to bring their temperature from say 20 degrees sub zero mm -hmm. to say 15 degrees now look at the difference from 20 to 30, 20 degrees minus to 15 degrees you have they have to cover 35 degrees mm -hmm. now you cover 35 degrees purely through the modern technology you need the immense amount of energy in fact which you don't have right but if you use traditional methods right for example if you dig the say uh, ground water you take it from say 20 meter down right and through the siphon technology it doesn't take much of energy a very small motor mm. will bring the underwater underground water and then it'll take it down bring it back take it down that process alone can cover up to 15 to 20 degrees which is instead of 35 degrees through pure technology now your load is about 10 degrees or maybe 12 degrees and that doesn't cost you anything the nature has given you that right and it's a traditional knowledge but nobody bothers you know is i would add to this sir and say the roman technology of making the villas where you had uh, warm air being piped below yes. the level of the ground so that the floors were always warm and if the floors are warm yes. uh, in a stone even a stone floor the floors are warm the house feels house warm exactly uh, <clears throat> thank you so much and uh, uh, i would also propose a separate workshop i'm just a question for you ma'am you know it's, we've got such a glorious history i mean uh, what would you suggest how do we uh, convey this or uh, how do we uh, uh, no put forward to the next generation because you know i was talking to my daughter the other day and she says everything feels so apocalyptic and i mean uh, where are we going we feel like you know the younger generation is so depressed so how do we connect the past to the present and to the future ma'am how would you what what would be your suggestion I'm sorry that's one of the most difficult questions I've been asked ever because I don't know the answer. I know that at my level I keep getting into schools, I talk in schools, I arrange for little workshops when especially in the now with the CBSE pattern where they have to do projects and uh, thing. I volunteer to for all the CBSE schools and all the ICSE schools. I'll come and give a half hour talk to your students on different things. Every 6 months I go and volunteer. But I I know that I am a rarity in that most people don't want to go into schools to talk. We have to go to the schools and talk to them at that level. It's no point talking in an audience of this kind where we know what we are looking at. We need to get we have to get into the school system. And it has to be something outside the syllabus because given the school structure, students who are told something within the syllabus will promptly close their ears. it is a it is a automatic reaction of any so are fir se aa rahe hain bore karne ke liye is going to be the reaction make it something out of the ordinary and weave it into this that is our only way of getting the youngsters and given a couple of sessions like this they are enthusiastic enough to call back and say ma'am wo pehli baar aapne wo bola uske bare mein aur thoda batao so that has to be the only way to go we can't do it on a mass kill this up i mean this model i agree with you we can't how do we do it across the country across uh... we get volunteers to talk at different levels at schools we get a team that can talk in different schools in different places that's the only way i can think of um, um, i mean i i definitely propose uh, under the mrc banner we would be conducting a full day workshop where i want our right now we have about 10 fellows ma'am research fellows and who have a significant uh, bit of work so it will just bring focus uh, to the conversation uh, rather than being a generic conversation and i would like them to present first to you and then uh, kind of have an interaction so that and then it will be taken forward it will not be a one off kind of a thing yes
and bazu mudgal sir no i think uh, what a fascinating conversation in fact i i'm really fascinated though i am a technology person per se and diplomat by profession but i am deeply embedded in uh, history yeah, because uh as we are discussing you know uh your embedding in history can connect you better with your future my problem and you mentioned that is this arrogance of silos you know this human comfort i want to be where i i know and i do not want to be where i do not know that comfort that is what in fact uh, uh, professor you will remember uh, i should name uh, we had this uh, very intense conversation on how the technology is creating information bubbles you know the problem with technology we thought technology will open the doors right unfortunately technology is closing the doors today we have the information bubbles where people are literally talking to themselves they are not talking to anybody else because the technology has given you that comfort because when i was a young boy if i had to find somebody who thought like me it was a great effort i couldn't find so easily the person who thought like me as a result i had to all my life deal with people who did not think like me yes so that was the situation which did not allow silos of over specialization yes because the over specialization silos are dangerous in fact so i had to deal with many people who would not think oh, they will they will every day they will challenge me right and many a times i would accept their challenge and i would admit their challenge and would then try to adjust my own thoughts that somewhere i am wrong but today no today through social media you can find 2000 people in few seconds who think exactly like you and as a result you have a comfort level you have a community which thinks exactly like you so why would you leave it Well, professor sir in fact i i am deeply grateful to you i go to village schools yes in case you want people to grow up with an open mind i think we need to go there don't i we can keep talking to the stale steel frame of minds but i don't think we will achieve that thing there because they are already completely solidified in a particular thought but those youngsters in schools they still are looking for arguments to challenge themselves in fact unfortunately this is very unfortunate the grown ups are not accepting challenges right but the youngsters are still willing to accept the challenge so before it's too late i think we need to go to them and tell them there is a different world available from what you live in and you must understand that yes the silos have to break but for that's the only answer let me tell you unless we tell people you know there are other ways of thinking about life than you have been doing you may not accept it but please you should know and once we know there is a possibility that we will negotiate uh those conflicts much better you know otherwise these conflicts will become very very sharp right and we need to really really avoid that happening right i thank you very much really yeah thank you thank you thank you so much ma'am uh, we'll take a, a, a small tea break and then we'll uh, assemble back Dr. Vladimir sir thank you so much for joining us Dr. Can no, you hear me Thank you Yes I can hear you well Do you hear me well as well I can hear you very well sir thank you thank so you. much sir Thank you for the invitation Just to give you a sense of this event that we are doing it's a series of uh, four workshops 
The first five days is on policy. We have speakers from all over talking about various aspects that can contribute to policy intervention. Uh, starting uh, today is the third day. The first day we had Ambassador Mudgal, who was instrumental in designing the Sagar vision of the Honorable Prime Minister of India. He was the ambassador of India to Mauritius when the declaration was done there. Then we had Professor of Economics and Politics from IIT Guwahati, who spoke on various aspects of how economics and politics plays a role in policy making. Then we had some industry uh, <coughs> captains and academicians also giving their views on what the underwater domain is and how it is important in the present geopolitical and geostrategic context. Then today, before your lecture, we had a maritime historian talking about the various aspects of history, how lessons can be learned from history, and most importantly, looking at the traditional knowledge and the traditional practices which need to be kept into uh, kept in mind when we are looking ahead. Because if we disconnect from history, if we disconnect from the past, I think we'll go horribly wrong. And how our predecessors have actually engaged with the ecosystem, engaged with nature, is something we really need to, and it was a fantastic presentation. Uh, all our talks are available uh, online and they will be all recorded and uh, made available to, uh, so this is in hybrid mode. We have people here and we also have uh, online participants from all over the world. Uh, today, uh, it will be your lecture and after your lecture, uh, we have our student, uh, our research fellow, who will be uh, also talking about the marine spatial planning work that we are doing at Maritime Research Center. Then post your lecture, post lunch uh, in India. Uh, to, uh, right now it is 11.30 uh, in the morning. And post lunch, uh, we have a lecture on uh, the dif different uh, choke points that are there globally and how they are important in the larger maritime uh, supply chain. And that has an impact on the marine uh, maritime shipping and the entire maritime activities. And there is a lot of geopolitical and geostrategic uh, connections to that. So he'll, he's going to talk about why these choke points are important. And at the end of the day, we have a presentation on the UDA Digest platform that we run. It's a, a platform, a digital platform where we have more than 70 to 80 articles which cover the various aspects of the underwater domain awareness framework that we are driving. So then tomorrow we have a series of diplomats talking on various aspects. We in fact have the Indian ambassador to Paris, to France, uh, Ambassador Javed Ashraf who will be addressing the gathering. He'll be also speaking from Fra uh, Paris like you. Uh, we have the ambassador of India to Croatia He'll be speaking from Jagreb. Uh, Ambassador Raj Srivastava will be speaking from Jagreb. And we also have uh, Ambassador Gunatileke from Sri Lanka on the small islands and their challenges. Uh, so tomorrow we have a series. And also uh, your colleague Neha Midha from uh, UNESCO Delhi uh, will be talking tomorrow, uh, will be joining us tomorrow. And we are also likely to have the Joint Secretary Indo-Pacific from the Government of India uh, addressing the gathering early in the morning. And the last day we have, now the government of India also realizes that there is significant amount of work required to work on the capacity building across different levels. Right on top at the policy making level, at the mid level with the stakeholders and also at the working level with the practitioners. So we are collaborating with them and the secretary himself is traveling down to Pune from Delhi and to interact with us. There is a, a panel discussion in the morning on water resource management and what are the ma modern tools and also what are the livelihood uh, uh, opportunities and challenges. So there is a, a former chairman of the Central Water Commission of India who is uh, going to be joining us uh, online and also there is uh, Professor uh, Ajay Dandekar who is also an um, academician, but he has been doing a lot of work on the ground and he's the president of the Bharat Rural Livelihood 
foundation this is a government of india establishment working for creating rural livelihoods and their focus is quite a bit on water we are their knowledge partner for the river systems and the coastal uh, how to manage the coastal communities so with that brief uh, and then we have next 5 days uh, next week on the technology uh so there are a lot of people uh, who will be coming and talking about the entire digital ocean framework and uh, also uh, practitioners and also industry representatives who will be coming the third uh, workshop five days workshop is a field trip and interaction with the community so we are driving about uh, 500 kilometers away from pune to the coast and we will be interacting with various communities there people engaged in aquaculture people engaged in mangrove uh, management people involved in uh, uh, um, underwater diving and whole lot of other activities and also certain co uh, coastal community groups that are there people involved in seaweed cultivation so uh, that's a five day program and then once we come back we have a two day uh, workshop to actually sum up what we discussed and and then this report will be taken to the government and also uh, you have been part of it so we will be also reaching out before it is released we will be sharing the draft with you and once uh, it is gone through all the resource person i think we would be in this uh, whole uh, period we may be hosting more than 60 resource person of very high uh, 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 level Uh, like you and many others and i think i will share uh, uh, the detailed program uh, with you and you'll also like to have a look at that so uh, we'll get started uh, uh, i'm so uh, happy and we are very very fortunate and honored to have you on board and i would first request that's our tradition here we don't introduce a speaker we request the speaker to introduce himself something about himself uh the uh, his basic uh, journey and also uh, some of the work that you are doing and then you would also like to tell about your organization a little bit and then uh, you may like to continue with the presentation so uh, <coughs> dr bradimir extremely uh, <coughs> thankful to you and really appreciate you getting up early morning at paris to address our workshop thank you so much over to you Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Na, for this uh, uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, you know, um, actually, uh, not even knowing that tradition, I've already included some um, slides uh, about the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO that I uh, am heading. So uh, you will you will hear about this, but you know. I uh, also had a slide about myself but I removed it in the interest of time. So but I will tell you uh, some words about myself uh, when when the time comes in the in the course of the presentation. So I hope uh, this is uh, uh, convenient for you and will be also done in the I would say in in appropriate time so it will be easier to uh, so now I started to share my slides and uh, could you please confirm that you see the slides well according to what i understand it so should be should be okay now so um you know um dr ranap asked me to speak about uh, maritime special planning or marine special planning uh, but you know everything um, has to be uh, framed properly so that's exactly why i wanted to uh, come to this maritime special planning in a logical way and uh, Uh, present to you how why it is needed and what is the larger perspective on 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 maritime special planning and management of of the ocean so uh, uh i will speak about uh, a little bit about iuc uh, as a part of the united nations system sustainable development agenda and how it relates to the ocean then um uh, I will also speak about the the situation in in uh, in the ocean and also uh, about the dedicate of ocean science for sustainable development. I will introduce to you on various ocean management domains uh, and then embark on the maritime special planning. So, you know, uh, this is uh, I'm I'm sure that you cannot read this almost, but you know, this is the United Nations system. Basically the system that is, was invented 
uh, after the First World War, and then re, uh, uh, kind of got the second incarnation after the Second World War. Um, so uh, the, the peace is, uh, remains, uh, the development continues, and the, the system includes so many bodies and organizations that uh, uh, I just wanted you to have a, a, a look at this and, and a glimpse of uh, that would be uh, telling you how complex is the system still trying to work as one. And uh, uh, encircled by the oval, you will see UNESCO. So the, in the Governmental Oceanographic Commission of of UNESCO is uh, uh, is a part of that United Nations Environmental Scientific and Cultural Organization. We also enter uh, the the word club wouldn't be uh, appropriate in the sense because it's a it's really a community of twenty six organizations that have mandate in the in in, in the in, in the, uh, related to the ocean in their work. And they are all operating in relation uh, and, and under the United Nations Convention of Law of the Sea that uh, uh, was agreed in, in 1982 and, uh, and then came into force in 1996. And I have to congratulate the ocean community because last uh, Saturday, the United Nations also agreed on the uh, addition to the Convention of Law of the Sea on uh, biodiversity beyond areas of national jurisdiction, which is an instrument for maintaining life at the highest seas. So, a few words about IUC. You know, uh, it's very special for me always to speak in India, because uh, it is uh, the Indian Ocean, International Indian Ocean Expedition, uh, in the 60s, that, uh, or, or actually in, uh, in the late 90s, that gave gave birth to IOC because it became clear uh, to the uh, to the giants on on the shoulders of of of, of, of which we are standing uh, that uh, we need uh, uh, an organization in which different uh, I would say political systems scientists from them would speak, and this is a, a, a photograph from. Um, the courier of UNESCO that is also quite old, and uh, and and about that expedition. So what happened after the establishment of IOC in 1960? Uh, it was that uh, the, the the world has changed dramatically. You see how exponentially the population grew. Uh, so many things changed. Uh, uh, and this is just a graph showing fertilizer consumption, which is also changing, uh, was changing significantly. Climate was changing. So basically, uh, there was, in 2015, uh, this, uh, it, 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 when the um, Sustainable Development Goals were adopted, it became clearer that ocean is a big issue, actually, because of the health of the ocean. So in because of that, IUC had to change. And if previously it was the, in the governmental platform in the United Nations for dial, uh, dialogue, comparison uh, between different communities and, and, and countries in ocean science, night, right now we are turning into um, an enabling platform. So uh, the ocean science would be able to address existential issues for the humanity. That's the current role of uh, IOC. And, um, and this is the current portfolio. So the portfolio, I would say, rotates around six functions of IUC in the United Nations system. It is to stimulate ocean research, develop an uh, observing system uh, that generates data and exchange of data, generate early warning services, um, real-time services, I would say, that is very close to what uh, um, the concept of SAGAR and the uh, underwater awareness is, 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 is aiming, um, and also um, generate information for assessment of the situation in the ocean and how ocean interacts with society and atmosphere as a part of the air system, and then to move to sustainable management on the basis of science develop uh, and or use science to develop better governance of the ocean. And uh, you will see a lot of acronyms here, a lot of words, and each of them is actually a, a very major program. Uh, and uh, uh, for example, the, the, uh, on the 
uh, lower right, you will see JEPCO. This is a joint program with International Hydrographic Organization. General bathymetric chart of the ocean. We have been able to move in the coverage of the ocean depths from 5% of, of the coverage map with, with high resolution, relatively high resolution, to 24%. 5% was achieved in 2016, and 24% in 2023 and this program exists for more than a year so excuse me more, more than a century so during the century we achieved uh, five percent and then added 19 percent of the area of the ocean in just uh, seven years so that's that's the current speed speed of activities there so a little bit about myself uh, i am a mathematician by my education but I was, uh, I, I fell in love with the ocean uh, even before I graduated from the school. And uh, all my life I was uh, uh, working on, 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 on the ocean. Uh, but uh, once um, it was still in the Soviet Union, my government uh, called me uh, to a very high uh, office and, and told me that what the country needs is medium range weather prediction. So I kind of, uh, deflected from uh, from the ocean research and was part of the group uh, and I was the one who implemented uh, all physical parameterizations except radiation into a new model of uh, weather prediction. So in, in the USSR in 1985 we started uh, weather prediction and then I came back and developed uh, 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 Vin wave model that uh, in, uh, of the third generation for those who know the classification, and uh, so in those models the time step is of the order of uh, I would say seconds, and my model was able to run stably with uh, uh, time steps of uh, of the order of uh, I would say 20 30 minutes, uh, and highlight in my life was. Uh, uh, a project in the Russian Arctic that required studies of how ice can um, uh, gouge uh, the bottom and damage the pipeline. We developed a technology for um, assessing the safe bearing depths of pipeline and this uh, opened actually possibility of uh, trans Porting gas from uh, from the, uh, for example, uh, Yamal Peninsula to to Europe and many other places, crossing uh, crossing the water uh, uh, objects there. Another highlight was uh, in in relation to the Gaspian Sea, uh, in which sea level rise uh, uh, in 1977. Uh, started and in 1995 it was 2.5 meters. It's not like in the ocean in which we have uh, two three millimeters per year. In the average, it was uh, um, 2.5 meters. They're usually the, uh, the height of the room. So um, there was an idea to build a protective wall around the northern part of the Caspian Sea, in which the terrain is really flat and a lot of uh, infrastructure was uh, flooded. But uh, our studies show that sea level rise uh, was create, created by an anomaly of um, precipitation in the watershed of Volga. That in turn was related to sea surface temperature anomalies. Uh, and uh, we, we saw, because of the monitoring of the ocean, that anomalies were changing the configuration. So we uh, acted against the wall. And then in 1997, sea level started to drop. So that was, I think, uh, we saved for the country around three billion US dollars. And then I moved to United Nations and uh, worked for the World Climate Research Program. There was a big work, and we uh, actually uh, helped uh, the world to develop climate predictions. And now I am moving forward uh, as Executive Secretary of IOC. And uh, the goal is basically to use the science to save the ocean. And I think we are successful in this, despite it is a, a, a an enormous task uh, in the sense that we are creating conditions, the science that is uh, necessary to save the ocean. And part of that is the maritime special planning uh, about which I'm going to speak. So now let this takes me to the uh, second part of my talk. I will speak a little bit sustainable development and the ocean. So you will see here a lot of uh, 
uh, logos uh, showing different frameworks in the climate system. I already mentioned that in the convention flow of the sea, there is now a new extension on biodiversity beyond the areas of national jurisdiction, convention on climate, biodiversity, various convention under, under the Food and Agriculture Organization, uh, conventions against pollution, the small island development states, pathway, uh, Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, and of course the the convention on on climate uh, excuse me the, uh, excuse me the the uh, sustainable development goals under the 2030 agenda there will be new um, in international legally binding instrument on plastic pollution that is now in the making so there is no shortage of of the frameworks but what is really happening in the world is that the emissions uh, keep uh, growing uh, there were some uh, drops uh, related to, say, dissolution of, of my, my ori original country, and then uh, global financial crisis around 2008, and eight, then also uh, in relation to COVID. But basically, despite the Paris Agreement, Convention on Climate, the emissions uh, keep growing. And my own estimate is that uh, so far we are going to the scenario according to which the temperature increase by the year to 2100 will be of the order of four degrees that is making our planet much less uh, uh, livable and this is definitely a, a huge a huge disaster so you know such things have actually be uh, discussed many times in the world climate search program and just a personal remark one of the meetings was uh, at the institute for tropical meteorology in pune i still remember that wonderful visit and and charming town and uh, and, and good people there so you know the ocean is consuming uh, uh, carbon dioxide uh, and, and some other greenhouse gases from the atmosphere and this leads of course as everyone knows in oceanography to the uh, decrease of ph which is called ocean acidification the water is still alkaline not yet uh, uh, i would say acidic but at the same time the, the the properties of water are significantly changing and of course uh, there are some many and many other issues um, that uh, lead uh, to not to warming, uh, uh, to acidification, and also to loss of oxygen in the ocean. And what we observe around India actually is a, a significant decline of the oxygen in the um, in the in the open ocean in the Indian Ocean surrounding India. So this was uh, and many other things were reflected in the State of the Ocean report that we published. It was also my idea for IOC to publish this report. Uh, to compile and publish this report, which is a big difference, of course. And uh, you, you see just uh, some extracts from that report. Uh, the focus uh, was on what is happening because of the human impact on, on the ocean and what is happening naturally. So, for example, we will see the input of silicates in the, in, in the ocean, and we will see that uh, the baseline and the, and the current graph basically coincide. There are different ways of measuring this. And you will see that there are some natural variations. Uh, and uh, what is coming to the ocean naturally remains to some extent content, uh, con constant in the climate sense. But the input of phosphorus, input of uh, nitrogen, they all keep growing. And also, uh, we were able to, for the first time, understand uh, the picture of plastics in the ocean. Uh, the data remains really patchy. So, and the conclusion uh, from the uh, pilot store was about uh, our knowledge. So, in general, we more or less well understand what is happening in the ocean. However, we uh, cannot really describe this in a quantitative sense, which is necessary for some decisions. So this uh, really was a call for us to further um, con convince government to increase input in the ocean science. And of course, um, continuing uh, this, the, same, the same language, because, you know, I used the language from the Plymouth Marine Laboratory, which once published a, a briefing called... Uh, hot, sour, and breathless ocean. So we can continue in the, in the same uh, line of, of, of using such strong adjectives. So the ocean is also polluted by the plastics. 
uh, it's, it's wounded because uh, of the illegal fishing. And you will see these two, uh, two schools, and you will see that, uh, unfortunately, uh, 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 illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing still is a huge, huge 40% uh, of the total uh, correct catch in the ocean. And we are now starting together with uh, several organizations to study more about uh, chemical pollution of the ocean. Right? You know, basically, uh, when it comes to several seas, the ocean water is not really um, that what we think about this. This is basically uh, a, this, uh, um, a solution of different of different uh, chemicals, including, uh, for example, pharmaceuticals and uh, uh, including a lot of uh, relaxants. So you know, and this is starting to, to also to 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 affect uh, marine life. Now, um, one important thing that also was mentioned in the movie that preceded this session. So uh, there are several scenarios for sea level rise. Um, and uh, what I think really is uh, troubling is that sea level rise, there are some factors that uh, um, impact uh, the geographical distribution. And there is mean sea level rise, but uh, regional variations of sea level are very well seen on the graph here. And there are some regions of the world in which uh, the sea level rise uh, actually coincides with the strongest the tropical cyclones. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, uh, everyone in the oceanography knows that uh, there are two uh, major inputs to sea level rise, thermal expansion of water, but also uh, melting of, uh, of grounded ice, particularly from Antarctica and Greenland. And uh, the uh, in, in intuitive approach to what is going to be impact of the melting of, for example, Antarctic ice relates, uh, uh, people would think that, you know, the ice is melting around Antarctic, so sea level rise should be maximum uh, around Antarctic. It's not the case because uh, the ice that is now is melting was forming the mass of the Antarctic pin, uh, Antarctic uh, continent. When there is uh, less ice, then there is less mass, then there is less attraction to underlying uh, of, of underlying water, and because of that, there is a decline in sea level closer to to the Antarctica, and you will see this decline in. Um, in, in, uh, in, in on, on the graph, and the water basically goes to the areas uh, uh, at the distance of the radius of the Earth, around 6,000 kilometers, and we have the maximum sea level rise where the tropical cyclones are. So this is uh, the picture of the future world. So, you know, this is quite dramatic, and the sustainable development agenda um, uh, actually is attempt of, of uh, humankind to live in in decent way now and live uh, basically uh, past the, the earth in the same decent form um, and with all the resources and all the constructs on the policies to the future generations so they also could live well but it is, is not actually reflect on the support to the ocean sustainable development goal 14 of the ocean is the by far the least funded this is what we need to change because, you know, we are acting, I would say, symptomatically, not at the root of the problem. So, and this has implications also for ocean sciences and how we know the ocean. A recent study of the European Global Ocean Observing System showed that meteorological networks are roughly three times more uh, sustainable because there is a special convention on the law of the uh, 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 special convention on the World Meteorological Organization uh, signed in 1947, and countries are obliged to conduct and share observations. There is nothing like this in the ocean. We are operating on the basis of goodwill. And because of that, our networks suffer from, uh, say, complications that governments uh, experience and some, some other factors. So 28 uh, um, percent of the networks are more or less stable in the uh, foreseeable future, which is uh, much less than in meteorology. And more than half of uh, ocean networks uh, foresee that there will be problems in two, three years. So with that, we have to observe the ocean, uh, make continuous time sets, so uh, time series. So uh, that, that's the current situation. And that is exactly the situation that we need to change. Is it possible to change that situation? The answer is, and this is uh, also, also presented to us by science, the answer is yes, it is possible.
So there was uh, and still is a high level panel for sustainable ocean economy. Um, and I have to say that uh, uh, this panel was organized by the Prime Minister of Norway uh, in 2017, 18. Uh, and the idea was to see what we can do in the ocean. She is, she is passionate. She was, because now there is a new Prime Minister of Norway. And there are only uh, those heads of uh, government uh, or, or heads of state that are st still still uh, in, on, on, in the post that are part of that panel. So basically, um, the science community accompanied uh, the, the brainstorming of, of the high-level panel. There were more than uh, 20 different pages, uh, excuse me, papers uh, um, prepared. And this resulted in the uh, analytical report on the transformation of ocean science and our activities in the ocean, showing what is possible. And the thing is that, indeed, uh, uh, it is possible to start managing the ocean sustainably on the basis of science, and this will uh, create much more food from the ocean, energy from the ocean. Of course, we are speaking very much about uh, uh, wind energy. Uh, this uh, can be achieved uh, by continuing to reduce uh, carbon emissions uh, through various means. 20% uh, of the emissions related in the ocean can be, can be uh, reduced. Uh, this can be done uh, keeping the ocean healthy or restoring the ocean. And this will lead to basically an, an order of magnitude increase in, uh, in the uh, output of the ocean industry. This is all possible, keeping the ocean healthy. So that is a complete, uh, I was saying, over, uh, run of the, uh, over change of the situation. And for that, we need to have enablers. S uh, stopping land-based pollution is number one. It has been with us for a very long time, and uh, particularly with plastic, it's not improving, but there are some prospects now. Of, and this uh, Dr. Arnab mentioned, for example, uh, the water issues and the approach on uh, source to sea, uh, including uh, the whole uh, watersheds as a part of the common consideration is a way of doing this. But uh, also we need to change the economy and finances in the ocean, because, you know, uh, uh, having uh, this included in the system of national accounting, uh, so there is a full understanding of how much GDP is generated in the ocean. What is the uh, monetary value of ecosystems in the ocean and whether we are overusing them or um, increasing, investing in the value of ecosystems. And more importantly, the third parameter that is undeveloped but needs to be developed is how we can interact with the ocean so individuals, people would get benefit from, from the ocean without undermining it, its value. This is about democracy, this is about well-being of people, well-being of the ocean. So that is a, a new look um, that uh, partially scientifically is not yet fully developed. And all of this uh, is based on science, uh, which needs to create data and guidance for the decision making. And this will result in something that I would like really uh, you to take home as the main message from my presentation. The notion of sustainable ocean planning, to which the uh, SAGAR uh, idea, underwater uh, awareness idea are contributing, is the idea of sustainable ocean management on the basis of sustainable ocean planning. And those uh, communities, uh, we were part of this, that were uh, uh, concluding on this document, I think they clearly missed one enabler because, you know, we need, really need to include uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation in the list of enables because ocean economy is going to grow uh, twice as fast if the climate is favorable for that, if there is uh, mitigation and adaptation climate. If not, the ocean economy will be going uh, faster than other economies of the world, other types of economies, but less uh, quickly uh, as, as the, uh, the other, uh, other uh, uh, types of economy. So now I'm going to speak about the decade of ocean science for sustainable development. And... Um, this was actually our response to the situation that I presented to you. We had, uh, uh, I came to the office in, uh, as executive secretary for SC uh, exactly, almost exactly 
uh, eight years ago uh, in March 2015. And uh, during that year, we had uh, a sustainable development agenda uh, uh, adopted by United Nations and many, uh, the Paris uh, uh, Agreement on Climate adopted. So there was a new situation in the world. It was possible to uh, present to United Nations the idea of a significant increase of, of, uh, of the work in ocean science. So uh, that was the idea that came from the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO. And we coined the first ideas uh, uh, about this and approached the General Assembly of the United Nations with the document, the title page of which you see on the left, the ocean we need for the future we want. And then uh, we had uh, tough, toughest negotiations with the General Assembly and uh, and the result, they decided to adopt, uh, to proclaim the decade of ocean science already in the December 2017, giving us three years to start developing the implementation plan, which we did with a lot of communities. So basically, um, the plan foresees that by the year 2030, we will be on the way or achieving already uh, seven qualities of the ocean, clean, healthy, resilient, productive, predicted, safe, accessible, inspiring, and engaging ocean. You can clearly see from those objectives that some of them pertain to uh, the quality of water, for example, clean, pertain to the quality of ecosystems, healthy and resilient. Uh, but some of them really relate to, uh, to, to people, inspiring and engaging. It's about us people. And then um, uh, the community agreed uh, on uh, 10 areas where the maximal progress is required in ocean science to understand and get rid of pollutants, to understand uh, how ocean ecosystems function, which because we don't at, uh, at the time, generate more food from the ocean sustainably, generate ocean economy. We actually, we tend to use not the term blue economy, but the term sustainable ocean economy. Um, and then uh, work in the ocean climate nexus where there are a lot of solutions to understand ocean-related risks, for example, tsunamis, uh, uh, how ocean affects uh, tropical cyclones and many other risks related to sea level rise, and, you know, can continue. This actually ocean economies, ocean industries now, uh, many of them are becoming much less sustainable. And uh, so uh, that is a huge area. And this uh, should be done on the basis of better observations of the ocean, representing the ocean digitally. In this particular connection, I would like to mention the notion of, of the digital twin of the ocean. That would be a, a model of the ocean, which would be uh, presenting to us in, in a four-dimensional way key parameters of the state of the ocean that will be reflecting the future evolution in relation to different actions. Imagine that there is an action, for example, build something, uh, or uh, change change uh, policy on something, and then we'll be able to see the consequences. This will really enab enable decision-making in the ocean, make this decision making much more transparent because the decision-makers makers already know what is the likely outcome of their actions. They will have to act more responsibly. Capacity development, that was also mentioned here, and most importantly, behavior change. The humankind doesn't know that they live on the planet ocean. And, you know, they don't know that uh, the larger part of the oxygen air system is generated by the uh, photosynthesis by phytoplankton. So, you know, um, and this also needs to change. If, when, because people are able to protect only what they love and they only can love what they know. So that was the idea in the decade of ocean science. And I will skip uh, introduction to ocean science and uh, say that, you know, we were successful. And we generated actually the largest undertaking in the ocean sciences ever. And now we have 45 different programs addressing uh, uh, issues in the 10 challenges, more than 200 uh, projects, more than uh, 400 different activities have been held uh, now, including conferences, seminars, uh, uh, various contributions also from United Nations agencies. Um, more and more countries are uh, joining. Uh, last week I was in two meetings in, uh, on uh, the World Ocean uh, Summit of the Economist and also our Ocean Conference in Panama. And uh, uh, the, the World Ocean Summit was in Lisbon. And we have now a new a news 
that uh, the Portugal is establishing the decade uh, committee uh, for the uh, uh, national committee. The same uh, I learned uh, when I was in, in, in Panama. Uh, so, you know, big things are happening in, in, in the ocean, and uh, we have basically a mechanism of co-designing what is happening in the ocean. And, uh, excuse me, and then I have to say that um, we um, also are maintaining the decade in the following way, because the decade is a co-design mechanism. Um, so communities come together. There is a special decade forum that is like LinkedIn for, uh, but for the ocean science. And then people register, they form communities of practice, and then they uh, interact with people around the world about, about that. So about what they would like to achieve. And this is uh, not only about money, because we were able to generate 1 billion US dollars around the world for, for those activities, but mostly about changing people's mind, uh, minds. And so people could really uh, work together and co-design the future ocean uh, through, through the lens of science. Now, let me show to you uh, a graph uh, depicting um, different ways of managing the ocean. So coastal zone management, maritime special planning, these are area-based uh, ways of managing the ocean, contributing to sustainable ocean economy. There are also uh, ways of protecting the ocean. And now we are going to, uh, we, we are going to have that uh, uh, new international legally binding instrument on biodiversity beyond areas of national jurisdiction, management of fisheries and aquaculture, adaptation mitigation of climate change in the ocean, part of that, uh, development of policies uh, related to the ocean, real-time services, for example, modeling and modeling of uh, uh, currents, uh, modeling of fronts, modeling of upfillings, by bio, uh, ecological modeling of the ocean, development of capacity, and of course, early warning systems. So, and today, I'm going to speak about the maritime special planning, as was requested. But I really felt that this general introduction would place uh, the, the work on maritime special planning in, in the right context. It's very important to have a big picture. And only with this big picture, the work on maritime special planning will be uh, uh, successful. So basically, you know, uh, maritime special planning is a public process of analyzing, allocating uh, distribution of human activities um, to achieve a, a number of uh, societal, ecological, and uh, uh, economic goals. Uh, usually, uh, previously, it was decided by political progress. Now we're trying to find a consensus. So MSP, this is this process that leads to MSP plan, which is an instrument for moving forward on various ways of uh, uh, working in the ocean. So uh, we uh, are going to monitor the state uh, of maritime special, uh, spe special planning in the world. Um, you through several means, including reporting this in the State of the Ocean report. And I have to say that uh, IUC started this work in around 2003. There was the first conference. At the time, we were just individual activities focused on the, how we can um, um, uh, combine different parts of activities in the ocean. And uh, in that sense, uh, now we have huge progress. More than 300 various activities, uh, initiatives exist in the world. More than 100 countries are involved in the process. So a huge boost uh, to the work of IOC of UNESCO came when we uh, managed to convince the European Commission that this is uh, really a, a, an important uh, way of managing the ocean. And together, we developed the first version of the roadmap for maritime special planning around the world. So, you know, and this, uh, because, you know, I'm speaking now to India, I have to say that please join us. Please do join us. Uh, Dr. Arnab, uh, you can, uh, if there is a wish to join us, uh, then please write to me and we'll put you in contact with the coordinators of the work on maritime special planning in, in IUC and basically the world. And then a new arena will start. So in 2022-27, there will be uh, a new updated roadmap uh, focusing on the 
additional development, uh, accelerated development of maritime special planning. And I will present to you the six elements of the new roadmap, six qualities of the roadmap. So, first of all, uh, we, uh, we understand how complex uh, MSP is, and uh, uh, there will be three actions focusing on the expansion of data sets and the diversification of data sets, and then how they can be used to inform uh, the process of reaching agreement, reaching consensus on uh, between different groups on how they coexist in, in the ocean. And of course, Decade will be a huge promoter of activities. Decade has fantastic um, uh, quality of engaging people and also being convincing to governments. The world is changing. And even at the conference of United Nations in Lisbon, um, 30 presidents uh, or prime ministers stated that they trust IUC. They uh, believe that all support should be given to the Decade of Ocean Science to move forward towards managing the ocean. The second part is capacity development. We need uh, the, the usual processes. We need to understand the needs uh, of the capacity development, understand where we are, uh, sustain mechanisms for co-designing the maritime special planning, um, expand this also to the regional level, and then uh, acquire resources. And maritime special planning saves money. It's, it generates income and saves money, and importantly, saves the ocean. So that's, uh, that's capacity. There will be several ways of doing this, including education and training. Then transboundary cooperation. Uh, you know, uh, imagine uh, ocean has no borders, and uh, imagine the situation uh, if there is a country in which there is a fantastic development, the ocean is clean and used, and there is a neighboring country in which there is no attention to the ocean, uh, then the first country will suffer. So this uh, designing transboundary maritime special planning. Uh, also take into account that the world is made of uh, ecosystems and there is this notion of large marine ecosystems there are more than 60 ecosystems so we have to expand our vision so we not only speak about uh, i say activities in the ocean industries but also see how this interacts with large marine ecosystems so cooperation needs to be promoted ocean is about cooperation so then climate smart msp i have to say I'm a climate scientist, and I, I, I know that there is uh, a need uh, to do uh, and, uh, and foresee our uh, agreements, uh, uh, maritime special planning, in under the lens of climate change, with the predictions. This community is not yet there. They simply try to understand the impact of climate change and develop guidance, how this can be, uh, can, can be done but I can foresee a much stronger approach because there are now meaningful climate projections, predictions, ensembles of those, and this can really inform climate smart MSP. So climate smart, sustainable ocean planning is for us the way to save the ocean and us and develop ocean economy. So marine protection and restoration, all the same, like climate has to be embedded in the maritime special planning. In addition to this, we also need to make sure that maritime special planning grows into the current activities. You know, uh, on, for example, um, in December, under the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity in Montreal, uh, in, uh, in Canada, uh, uh, Kunming Montreal uh, framework for bi the global frame, uh, biodiversity framework was adopted with several uh, goals, uh, several targets. One of these targets was uh, really, uh, well, the most important. 30% of the high seas will have to be protected now. So, but also then this brings to me the question, what are we going to do in this, uh, the remaining 70%? The ocean is, uh, uh, the ocean area is 71%, 70% of the area is, uh, remains non-protected. 71% or 70% uh, uh, of the 71% of the area is exactly 50% uh, of the planet area. So we need to uh, to make sure that maritime special planning and means of protecting the ocean in the high seas really coordinate with the, the protected part of, of the ocean. So uh, this is a huge development that is required. Again, 
sustainable ocean planning now for the high seas will be will be the way forward and then uh, how maritime special planning uh, special planning uh, helps to generate a sustainable ocean economy uh, and uh, the sustainable ocean economy has strategies also depending on climate so embedding this working uh, as a is a co-design mechanism in one forum so industries acquire the knowledge on maritime special planning and move forward in harmony between themselves is the way forward so that is what is happening so uh, uh, now as i said we had the first phase of a global initiative on maritime special planning um, there were some pilots in different parts of the world uh, and uh, the achievements of that uh, phase are significant uh, more than 500 uh, excuse me, uh, around 5,000 different stakeholders. Uh, you can see that uh, in the world, actually, there are 160 countries approximately, uh, no, 156, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, countries that have access to the coast, and 140 of them already already uh, know about maritime special planning, and uh, have we, we have a stakeholder in that countries in those countries so a lot of technical reports were published policy briefs so we we really uh, feed uh, this community with uh, with the current knowledge best practices and there will be uh, there is a guide guide really new guide actually the, the work on maritime special planning when we started this in 2003 it resulted in the publication of a nine step guide for maritime special planning this was done in 2009 but now there will be a new guide that will be much more uh, updated and i think much more useful than the previous approaches we also were learning in this process and now the maritime uh, special planning is starting its second phase so um please study the guide i think it will be useful for you and uh, and there will be uh, basically the guide will result result uh, in 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 the plan of ex further expansion of maritime special planning around the world what is important really important you know that uh, different countries may have different motivations um, maritime social planning is uh, really uh, spreading around the world, but each country almost has uh, its own uh, interests in the maritime social planning. Belgium has a very small coastal zone and huge number of activities. You can see the challenge there. Uh, in USA, uh, uh, they wish to develop uh, uh, renewable wind energy. Uh, how they coincide with other types of activities. In China, uh, they, they, they had a historically different approach called zoning. And you know, there were a lot of issues, a lot of conflicts between different users. This is the classical situation when maritime special planning. Australia mostly focuses on protecting uh, its uh, Great Bar Barrier Reef. Uh, so uh, that is uh, a way uh, of uh, combining maritime special planning with marine protection. And there are some other countries, big and small, in which there are different interests. Uh, biodiversity protection is a, a critically important element. Special uh, interests of countries that are surrounded by coral reefs, special interests, uh, for example, of EU, because there is, there is common legislation. So countries have to act uniformly, more or less, in, in managing the coastal waters. So each country is different. But the, the approach uh, of co-design solves pre uh, issues of all countries and maritime special planning, the guide uh, takes into account this, uh, this, this various uh, variety of needs. So the smart objectives that are usual classical objectives of any project, uh, focusing on ecology, economy and social issues in the way uh, uh, how we see the maritime special plan are actually um, uh, added by the two things which are critically important in the approach to maritime special planning it has to be inclusive and it has to be fair equitable so uh, we everywhere when we look at maritime special planning being honest to people being honest to yourself uh, acting in partnership including partnership and uh, dr arnab started the introduction to this lecture by uh, mentioning the indigenous or local knowledge not only it has to be taken into account, indigenous people have to be part of that. 
And actually in the uh, uh, IUC assembly that we're going to have in June this year, we're going to unroll um, for the first time as information document a summary of, of the best practices in indigenous and local knowledge. So this all is so important because, you know, ocean is uh, kind to us, keeps the life uh, on the planet uh, uh, alive. And we have to be honest to ourselves, to the ocean, in the kindness. Kindness is uh, so characteristic for Indian people. This has to be applied to the ocean. And the maritime special planning, sustainable ocean planning, is the way of doing this. So with that, I thank you for your attention. Stop sharing the screen. And all ears now to the next presentation of the young uh, professional. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Dr. Vladimir. Thank Definitely. You very, very comprehensive and also very inclusive uh, uh, approach. Uh, and uh, let me assure you, it is not only we talk about traditional knowledge, but we also are looking at community engagement. And that's, uh, as I mentioned, the third part of this workshop is about going to the coast, meeting the coastal uh, community and also riverine community. And uh, also, uh, we are working on another vertical uh, within MRC on uh, supporting the coastal and uh, <coughs> riverine communities on the uh, multiple technology tools, how they can use it to further their uh, livelihood and further their practices. And definitely, I mean, as I mentioned, there was a lecture before yours today. Uh, we would also like to map traditional knowledge onto technology or the other way. I mean, technology should be an enabler, not a replacement. So we are definitely working on that. We are very serious. Uh, uh, it's work in progress, certainly. But definitely, we are working on that. Uh, so I will uh, uh, quickly get uh, Sanskar Soni into it. And then uh, at the end of it, I would uh, invite questions for both of you. Uh, I hope that is OK, uh, Vladimir, with, uh, with you. Certainly, certainly. I'm all, all I'm with you, yeah, all the time. Yeah, yeah. Sanskar, uh, kindly take over and uh, make your presentation. Introduce yourself and then go ahead. Uh, very good afternoon to all. So, hi, myself, Sanskar, and uh, I am a chemical engineering undergrad at Indian Institute of Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. And uh, like I am in my third year, and I have been uh, with MRC since one last since last one year. And uh, I have done several projects here and uh, currently I am working broadly on MSP, the Marine Spatial Planning. And uh, what my job is uh, basically uh, combining the, the objectives of the MSP, which are the political, which are the, all the stakeholders like government, public sectors, private sectors, combine all of them to a certain technological advancement so that they can all be benefited from the same. As uh, Mr. Vladimir, sir, uh, you said, that there is a there is a role of sustainable development in marine spatial planning, and there is a term you mentioned that is smarty, the specific, measurable, relevant, achievable, time bound, inclusive, and equitable. So, in keeping that all in mind, we are working extensively in technological adv advancements and uh, using all the open source and uh, generating our own methods and uh, own efficient data sources to manage uh, the whole big data and the extensive data sets we are using and uh, using a lot of nice and uh, fast algorithms to uh, to, fo to fulfill the objectives of, of the MSP. So I would like to share a PPT with all of you. So hi everyone. So uh, I'm going to start with marine spatial planning. So these are some uh, contents of what I'm going to discuss about. So first is, is what is MSP? We will discuss broadly what MSP is, who are the different stakeholders in MSP, uh, technologies that are currently in use, and the different fields in MSP. This is a broad field. MSP is a broad field, and there's a lot of fields uh, which uh, the world is working on, and we will cover some of them. And finally, the what is the challenges in uh, uh, implementing all those? So first, we when when we go through what is MSP, the first term come in mind is the balance. It creates a balance between ecological, economical, social, and the cultural con components of the ocean. So it is a, the main component. What what we, we uh, sir also mentioned here, 
the second one is the integrated management it uh, covers ho- all the stakeholders together and manage all of them to a certain level so that everyone uh, everyone is fulfill their needs third is the conservation the most important part sir has also men- and also mentioned that there is a there is a need of sustainable development along with the technological advancements so this uh, the it, msp also covers the conservation part so the, the our future generation can also be benefited fourth one is a collaborative process so collaborative it uh, it uh, promotes the collaborative process between the stakeholders we will talk about later who are our stakeholders and the fifth one is the transparency and accountability when we include our all the stakeholders and uh, all the uh, and we promote the transparency equality okay and also there is accountability to each other and the last thing is it is accepted worldwide as sir has mentioned that 38 countries have approved the msp and uh, it is really a great achievement for msp then we uh, look at msp as a whole so this image i think is the broad thing which certainly describes what is msp it it talks about the blue economy it talks about the habitat it talks about the fisheries it talks about the local coastal people so this will uh, be the wholesome image for it so now we talk about who are the different stakeholders who are taking part in msp like when we see there's a first and the most important part is the government and the regulatory agencies because each of the each of the policies we make each of the technological advancements we make when we make a certain technology or when we make a certain software we have to go through the government and regulatory agencies to pass through it so this is a cert, uh, this is a very important stakeholder in msp second is the private sector actors when we come through the oil extraction there's a there's a cert, there's many companies who are working in oil extraction when we go through the fisheries management when we go through the transport when we Go, go through the recreational users there is a whole private sector is there so it is the most important stakeholder in msp third one is the ngo the who are working to the conservation part of the ocean who are working towards the betterment of the ocean who are working towards the betterment of the coastal people there fourth one and the most important for me is the scientific and the research institutions as i am the student of the the most prestigious college in india in the, there is a extensive research going on in the current area of ocean and the marine so the, this is a, this is the most important stakeholder for all the the students or all the uh, fellows working in mrc and the fifth one is the coastal communities of course the local people there and the recreational users who are the tourists there and who are for the fun they also are the stakeholders of msp because they are directly affected by them and the environment and environmental and the conservation groups who are working to working towards the betterment of the ocean for the working towards the betterment of the habitat and uh, plantation in the ocean as we see in the current world there's a there's a degradation in uh, coast uh, coastal reefs there which is really important for the the marine life and the another one is the international organizations uh, which are uh, which are really important who are the who play main role in uh, in uh, going through all the policies and uh, and implementing in all the world and of course the uh, the last is the general public who are the uh, end users of all the policies and all the technological advancements we make now we will talk about uh, uh, extensively on the technologies that are currently in use this is a certain slide which will make you familiar with the terms which i going to use uh, uh, in further slides and these are some technologies that are extensively used by uh, mrc and also many organizations to go through the technological advancements so first is the geographic information systems as we see there's a there's a there's a lot of work going on mapping there's a sedimentation mapping there's a fresh water mapping to have a certain uh, certain knowledge of what is changing how it is changing and second one is a remote sensing technology so it is a source of the gis remote sensing technologies basically include the satellite systems and sensors and the receivers and the sonars things uh, which are uh, important for the geographic information systems and the data which we get to uh, have some is analytics and uh, to uh, to apply it to our technological advancements third one is the autonomous underwater vehicles which uh, are the manual uh, non manual vehicles which are used to 
to uh, gather the data of salinity and temperature because ocean is such a dynamic uh, dynamic system and it changes readily with time and it changes readily with resistance also as a lot of parts just we go through 100 km the, the climate has changed uh, completely and this is a really complex problem in front of us fourth is the urn monitoring technologies there's a great work going on in mrc for the underwater radiated noise management and it is important for the conservation and the habitat protection as well as for the mapping of the places which are really hazard and uh, have high noise mappings real time monitoring technologies which uses real time data to uh, to analyze and to give the results at uh, the certain time modeling and the simulation tools blockchain technology this is the the point uh, where I, I i want to focus more because this is a certain thing uh, that is extensively we are going to use in mrc here because this technology uh, provides a decentralized uh, data inputs and uh, it is really important for us to have a decentralized system for the data so that uh, the data can't be easily manipulated the so data can't be easily uh, transferred and it is a safe and secure method to store the data we are essentially working on the fresh water data management in the blockchain technology and the last one is the artificial intelligence this is the most important thing which uh, is the i think base of all the technologies we are using and we will talk about some really good algorithms of artificial intelligence later in that uh, slides so uh, what are the different fields in msp first we will talk about the sediment management it is really important field in msp urn management fresh water management habitat protection and preservation shipping and transportation so i just uh, counted here the five and there are many fields in msp we are we, we can explore a lot but due to constraint of time i just uh, uh, mentioned five here and we will talk uh, de in detail about all of them first when we go through the sediment management when we uh, when we talk about sediment there is a clear uh, a clear vision in uh, in in front of us is uh, like a sediment load which is which flow with the water which is very common in the fluvial systems like rivers uh, and uh, the, the system which are fluvial so what are the aspects uh, what we have to work on what are the the the, the advancements we can do and uh, what are the current problems here so what i see personally is the sediment management uh, is a really important for the uh, uh, most important thing is to map the sediment management to get the idea to for where, where it can be uh, much and where it how it can be controlled and how it can be managed so i included two case uh, studies here for the sediment load first we talk about the total sediment load in rivers the total sediment load concludes the suspended sediment load in addition with the bed load so what this case study uh, defines is they are using the two machine learning models which is the multilinear regression multilinear regression and the support vector regression these two models are uh, used to uh, calculate the total sediment load and to predict the total sediment load in rivers but there is a issue like uh, when we see uh, here like uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of variables which affect the variance of the total sediment load and uh, in, in in language of machine learning we say there's a lot of variable who can change the result but there are certain uh, variables like two or three which are the principal components which is a which is a most uh, uh, which have the most weightage in changing the variance so to uh, to get that two or three variables we use the principal component analysis which is really important to identify the key drivers for the total sediment load and what pca do, do is it uh, it go through all the the key drivers and uh, find the two or three drivers which are really uh, important when which have which have really high weightage in calculating the tsl so that case study uses the, a data data set which is done in a phd study and that is uh, that have entries of 4759 data points so there are uh, two models they use so when we talk about the pca based mlr and the pca based svr model we didn't get that result so we have to go through the two things the, the th first is the step wise pca mlr and the second is the tenfold pca based svr model so we're going to compare these two models and find which one is better 
So what these case studies do is what uh, first I talk about step by PCA based MLR. So what step by do it do the step by regression and what the tenfold uh, PCA based do is like uh, we have a data set of approx 5000 data points. So what tenfold means is we divide the data set in 10 parts and the one uh, part is used for the test set and the nine part is used for the training set. And when we gonna repeat it for the old 10. So that's what why it's called the tenfold PCA based SVR model. So we're gonna uh, take out the uh, talk about the results here. So these are some results. So what we gonna uh, what we get from the result is that we find that PCA based SVR model they both perform the current existing models which are used for the total sediment load estimation but the model the, of the PCA based SVR model which is Stanford model is a really great model and which is performed better than the PCA based the machine uh, multilinear regression model. So this case study is very important for us to uh, to for the technological advancement in predicting the total sediment load which is not present in uh, real world as of now it is a case study we are gonna work upon it in the future times in MRC. This is a uh, this is a uh, this is a graph which which we, which shows that how PCA based SVR model performed very nicely in the uh, in the case study. So when you see the second graph, the B1, there's a observed data uh, data line which is uh, colored with red. There's a predicted data by PCA MLR which is colored by black, and there's a PC predicted by PCA based uh, SVR model which is colored by blue. So as we see that uh, PCA based SVR is close to the observed data. So this means that this model is really good and it is close to the observed data. So it is a most appropriate and the most efficient model we can use to predict the total sediment load. And now when I want to move uh, to the se second case study, uh, which is for the sedimentation mapping. And it is also a really important uh, field in the sedimentation management for the mapping of the sedimentation. So this case study is done in the Umlo city of Saudi Arabia. And what they use is the Sentinel, uh, there's a satellite called Sentinel-1 and it uh, clicked the images of the the part where, uh, where I want to explore or where I want to study. So when we go through the results of it, I found that uh, this the, that's uh, to get these images, uh, they uses uh, data pre-processing, data processing, and a, uh, and the image uh, uh, classifier models. So what we see here, when you see in your right, there is a image which is a uh, just before two months, the right image was taken. So when we see there's a lot of change in these two images. So what this case studies do is this analyze or analytically observe the changes in the sediment uh, uh, load and the sediment deposits uh, uh, in the certain period of time. And this is a really important project. So as it is, uh, uh, as it is important to know and to uh, conserve our uh, uh, rivers in the the coastal areas. And the, another thing which MRC is uh, uh, extensively working upon is the uh, URN management. And the what URN management is. Uh, the underwater radiated noise management is a really, really important uh, uh, co concept or problem uh, or uh, a field, I, I would say, because uh, there's a there's a greater problem for the habitat uh, uh, in the ocean, which really uh, affected by the noise in the ocean. So we are plan what we are doing is we are uh, uh, we are constructing a noise map in the 3d noise map in the ocean and uh, that uses a certain uh, uh, we are using uh, extensively new data sets like r trees we are using machine learning models neural networks to predict it efficiently and more accurately so what we are doing is we are pl plotting uh, we are plotting a part, uh, we are plotting uh, 5,000 receiver points in Indian Ocean and the Arabian Sea. And to the each receiver po point, we are uh, we are calculating the noise and then we will create a 3D map. So it it's going to be a, a completed uh, by this uh, month end. Now when we talk about the freshwater management, I think uh, this is a uh, this is a crucial uh, project uh, what we have to work upon or we will uh, work upon and we are working on uh, some of uh, my previous fellows or some of the uh, the uh, mates of my working currently on the freshwater management uh, uh, techniques 
and uh, what uh, uh, what we the, the, I included two case studies. The first case study is the predicting the water quality, which is the most important because in many areas of the world there is a lack of uh, lack of good uh, drinking water or lack of good quality of water, and there is a lot of harmful chemicals. Like when you talk, uh, when I talk about certain uh, cases in India itself, there is some places which has high fluoride component in water, which is really really important to to detect. Like uh, where it is uh, uh, more and uh, where it can, where how it can be uh, minimized. So uh, there are two case studies to predict the water quality and to predict it accurately and efficiently. So what first case study do is they they use several machine learning models and uh, they they choose uh, they, they they tried all of them and they found that the two models the machine learning regression uh, multilinear regression and the random forest models are the most uh, uh, effective and the most uh, lowest error models which we which they used and uh, the most influential parameters are the total dissolved solids and the total hardness in the water for the prediction of the water quality index now the what uh, second uh, case study uh, has done uh, that is done in the china so what they do is they th there is a problem of the in the first case study that they do not studying the components like uh, the water is a uh, the, the rivers are the fluvial systems and the freshwater systems are the fluvial system they flow uh, flow extensively so there is a very dynamic system so we have to uh, we have to take components uh, uh, across the the river and that's what they do they take the components uh, from different places and they uses the cnn and the lstm uh, algorithms uh, lstm is a really important algorithm which is sh long short term memory and uh, i think this is the most important algorithm which current world are using in the current ai technologies like we are listening about the natural language processing models we are listening about the chat gpt now uh, which is uh, which is using long short term memories uh, model uh, now the most important project we are going to work upon is the blockchain integration with the fresh water uh, data management so what this case study do is uh, let me uh, they they are trying to uh, collaborate between the data distributed storage systems and the blockchain so how it will how it benefits is like uh, it, uh, it, uh, it 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 did not the blockchain is very efficient tool to store the data uh, decentralized and store the data uh, to and it is a very secure system like uh, there are nodes there are several nodes in the blockchain there's a there's a whole lot of group of nodes in blockchain so if i want to change our data in the one node the whole data won't be changed only one uh, node data will change and that is uh, uh, i would like to explain uh, with the certain images so what this image concludes is what are the current problems and why we are want, we want to use the blockchain technology in the water storage systems or in the water data system so what this image show is like we collected the data from the water quality sensors now what is the problem there is energy con energy consumption there is a problem of hacking can be done of the data there is a time bound storage like time bound storage means like if i want to use that data 5 years of now 10 years of now so there is not the surety that i would find the data uh, very very sh very sharp or very clear that that some data will be missing some something would happen that data is lost but blockchain provides us a completely different uh, aspect of the time bound storage it is a completely secure system now we talk about the data integrity what data in data integrity is the data sustainability and the da data accuracy and that is not in the the current methods storage issues there's a in india itself when we see there's a great land which covers the fresh water system so there's a whole lot of data which can't be stored in the cloud systems or which can't be stored in certain data systems and that is a really big issue for the uh, for the storage of the data in mrc we are extensively working on the storage issues of data like we are using uh, really efficient data algorithms like r tree and uh, there are graphs uh, we are using and the, th the third is the wash data as we talk so currently what is uh, what the current world is doing they are storing in the cloud system they are storing the center storage systems and the user and they use with the user and research institutions 
so this is the the complex or the i say the simplest uh, version of how we can implement the blockchain so as we see above there uh, there we get the data now we uh, get the data from the iot internet of things now what we do is we use the kd dht algorithm so dht algorithm is a distributed hash table algorithm what it do is it creates hashes or we can say it creates the dictionary and stores the data in that nodes it encrypts the data with the with the uh, with the with the ipfs file which uses the cryptographic and uh, encryption which is really important for the for our process of uh, uh, of including the fresh water management and then we can extensively use the blockchain we are using ethereum as a backend in this now when we go through the habitat protection and the preservation i think this is the most important thing for the sustainable development uh, of the msp or when we talk about the conservation of the oceans so there's a there's a there's a scope of identifying mapping and monitoring of these habitats to understand their distribution extent and the eco ecological functions as uh, like what currently we are seeing is that there, there's a lot of local fisheries and there's a lot of private fisheries which are extensively fishing fishing in the oceans and we can see there's a there's a there's, there's a, the dolphins uh, are uh, going uh, the do dolphins are uh, uh, are faced and also there are certain places in the world there the the illegal uh, fishing are, are going on so we have to work on the habitat protection and the preservation and the technology can really help in this we can uh, develop some fishing gear restriction policy uh, policy and environmental impact assessments uh, we can define certain marine protected areas which are legally bounded uh, and now when we talk about the shipping and the transportation so shipping and the transportation i think is the uh, is the important thing as uh, i uh, as yesterday in a talk uh, 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 sir mentioned that uh, there's a the, the time taken to travel from pune to mumbai is more than time taken to uh, dip, uh, to load some uh, some uh, 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 lo load something from mumbai to the andaman so uh, this is a certain kind of thing why we you why we have to use the shipping and the transportation more extensively in the oceans because it is a it is very economical it is less time taken and it is a, uh, it is a very effective way of transportation but there are certain problems of shipping traffic and there is certain uh, problems of uh, uh, there is no speed uh, speed restriction speed sh shipping lanes so what we have to do is we have to uh, uh, implement some policy and techno uh, technical interventions such as shipping lane uh, shipping lane optimization vessel speed restrictions and environment, environmental impact assessments to minimize these negative impacts of shipping and transportations on the marine, marine environment now when we go through the whole uh, whole fields of msp the, uh, the certain fields of msp but they, these are not the whole this is uh, there are certain challenges which are there which are in front of us to implement all of this so first i want to conclude some challenges in policy intervention so first and the most important is the jurisdictional conflicts and the governance gaps as we all know if we want to uh, promote some policy if we want to go through some policy or if we want to uh, uh, go to the government uh, to uh, to approve some policy there's a lot of uh, uh, problems to get the get the get it done and this is i think where we lack uh, behind in the in the uh, oceanic development of the uh, marine spatial planning second one is a lack of clarity in legal frameworks and regulatory mechanisms for msp like there is no proper frameworks as of now uh, in the regulatory mechanisms and there is a lack of clarity in the legal frameworks and the third one is the inadequate funding and resources to support msp as we see there is a current growing rate of rate of startups going on in, in all over the world and we are seeing uh, that is, uh, funding is also coming to the marine uh, special parts but not that much what other sectors are having right now fourth is a lack of long term vision and the planning horizons what uh, some uh, uh, what people are doing they are they don't thinking about the long term vision or they are not thinking about the sustainable and the conservation part of the msp they just uh, want to develop something to get the profit 
or uh, to make something short term to uh, to just uh, fulfill the current needs they are not sustainably active or they are not think th- thinking about conservation and all so this is i think the challenges in the policy interventions and the second thing is the challenges in the technical adaptations uh, what i personally uh, personally face in my work a lot like there is a limited availability and accessibility of data like uh, if i take my example if i want to work on a certain project now first i have to think where i have to get the data if i have to get the data for the noise i have to go through the ais there is the only source which i can get the data for the 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 shipping information when i have to go through the fresh water uh, uh, mappings of the rivers or reservoirs i have to go to the government sites so i have to search a lot i have to browse a lot for the the data so there is not much data and there is not much uh, work done or there is not uh, much collection of the data in this field second is the complexity and the dynamism what i am talking about from the start like there is a the ocean and the river systems are really dynamic systems as these are the fluvial system there is a lot of climate change with the distances there are lot of salinity changes with the flow of the water there is a lot of sediment changes with the flow of water so oceanic systems are really dynamic and the fluvial systems are really complex and dynamic it is so hard to work upon and to apply some technical advancements on it so it is a difficulty in balancing the multiple and often competing objectives of the msp like when we talk about the objectives of msp these are like balancing between all ecological economical social cultural values and when we talk about the indicated management when we talk about the collaborative process transparency the there's a there's a great uh, great uh, uh, challenge uh, in front of us that we can't fulfill all the all the objectives of, of the msp through one technical advancement so there is a limited integration of emerging and innovative approaches we are trying to uh, we, are, we are we are extensively trying to minimize this uh, uh, challenge here in front of us so that uh, we are using new technologies like artificial intelligence we are using blockchains we are using remote sensing technologies and a lot of work going on and the other thing is a tropical constraints this is a i think the most important or the field uh, uh, field challenge i must say in the marine spatial planning implementation first is the climate change what i talked extensively about there is a lot of dynamics in oceanic systems in the fluvial system second is the coral reef degradation which is really important for the habitat which uh, is uh, uh, which is there in the ocean third is the coastal development there is a lot of development uh, going on in the coastal area which is a problem for the sustainability of the resources and the limited resources there is a limited resource or limited labor and the limited work going on uh, in the field of msp and uh, finally like uh, uh, carmen nuvela the european commissioner for environment maritime and fisheries and fisheries said that marine spatial planning is not just about the mapping it's about balancing competing demand for ocean space and resources and ensuring sustainable use for the future generations which uh, i want to conclude in my whole ppd that we have to uh, be certain sustainable uh, minded and uh, conservation minded and with the technical advancements uh, in msp Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Sanskar. Uh, as you said, uh, it's work in progress, and uh, uh, Dr. Vladimir, I think you will also notice uh, this is uh, one of the uh, projects uh, that we are doing, and uh, the other. Right now, we have ten uh, plus uh, research fellows who who have been working with us for some time now. and but each of them are also fed by um, multiple other interns who have worked with us earlier so uh, about 100 plus interns have contributed to the different projects uh, and when i say interns these are uh, young people from uh, very high caliber institutes in india iits and others so uh, bits pilani also and we are happy Uh, that now a lot of basic frameworks have been done like the modeling uh, for the underwater channel in the tropical water has matured significantly so now the researcher who works now doesn't have to go back into that i mean he uses that as a black box and moves forward 
then also uh, there has been a lot of work on specific uh, data management, data analytics. So that also has matured. I think it's a work of about six to seven years uh, that has brought us to this particular level. So right now uh, we are in a state where we can actually put multiple modules together to build a bigger system. So that's a broad thing. Uh, so I would request, uh, Vladimir, your comments on uh, the presentation that you saw and your uh, inputs and guidance on the next level uh, of that. Over to you, Vladimir. Um, yeah. You know, I think it was a very interesting presentation. And, um, but uh, the, the, uh, the difficulties mentioned there, you know, they're def definitely uh, so characteristic for, for the MSP, exactly because of the existence of those uh, difficulties. The, uh, the MSP is required. So moving forward in MSP um, is already a first and, and very important step. So it's, it's the decision. So I really congratulate you on, on, on the fact that you're working in this direction. Uh, you know, uh, also what teaches us the decade of ocean science for sustainable development is that uh, the uh, optimal combination of, uh, uh, I would say, exact sciences and then also social sciences, you can just, uh, human honesty is required. And I think, you know, um, uh, we shouldn't uh, overstate uh, the, the technical complications because I think we will sort sort them out. You know, it's but you know, uh, it, it, so you're going in the right direction. So uh, as as a uh, as a secretary for IOC, I think you know my first step would be to to just congratulate you and also bring you to the global community of people who can share with you uh, their wisdom, and you will be able to share your wisdom with them. So this is how IOC works. We are nothing but a platform for multiplying the wisdom in the relevant directions of our work. So um, I think, you know, uh, uh, indeed, uh, I spoke yesterday, it was in Japan, also online, of course, uh, about uh, the role of engineering in, in in ocean sciences and also in the decade, so there is a lot uh, of space for to, for the engineering and a lot of requirement in the world. I think about Africa, uh, the coastal erosion there is a huge huge thing undermining the future of the continent. So you have some excellent ideas there. So my impression is that. Uh, I congratulate Sanskar for, for, for that presentation. You know, at this age, I was, I think, not so developed. I can tell you for sure. <laughs> so congratulations. And I think you're on, on a very right track. And, uh, and uh, I also remember um, how two big communities were developing Earth system models in Europe and in the States. So in Europe, uh, the approach to Earth system modeling was... Um, that they were, uh, different groups were developing different different modules, and then uh, also several groups were developing interconnectors or connectors between the modules. In the states, they felt that the uh, accuracy of numerical interaction, full non-linear non interaction between models, were very important. And then the complexity of the model uh, and the need to constantly update it basically undermined the whole project. So in that sense, I think it will be very important if an MS, in, in MSP we will develop approach and I think the Indian culture and the, you know, the your education system, you know, you, you from, from, the, from the early, early childhood, you develop mathematics and all that vision that may help. Think about connectors. Think about how this can uh, really, and this means that we have to formalize, of course, the problem. Uh, and then have uh, some uh, KPIs that would be key performance indi indicators that would be helping us. And then, uh, uh, so that would be kind of methodological and technical part of that. But at the same time, 
we also keep uh, always have to keep the human dimension uh, on top on top of this so basically you know i'm very glad you know when when i was preparing for this presentation uh, i looked at what i did and what did, uh, i look at what uh, the ioc did and they uh, m people uh, that work on msp and ioc also together with the european commission they gave to me the the bulk of my presentation it's not me who developed this i actually thank them for that so just Let's just make this a resolution, so we'll bring you together uh, with these two, two big things, India and the rest of the world, I would say, in this particular case. So that's, that's my reaction. But, you know, great job, great job, really, you know, and, uh, so, and this is the future. Sustainable ocean planning, of which MSP is, is a critical part, is the way forward for us to work in the ocean. Uh, thank you so much. We definitely, we assure you that, uh, because I wanted to be uh, ready uh, before I uh, step into, because when I say ready, uh, we wanted to first uh, kind of be more uh, prepared in terms of the technology backing, as I said, you know, you need the backend uh, technology f uh, support and the framework. And I think we have, uh, and what we bring to the table is the uniqueness of the tropical conditions. Uh, so I think uh, we have done reasonable work now, and I feel confident that, you know, we can really may have some uh, more meaningful interactions. Uh, but we have also been keeping track of the non-science and non-technology aspects which are equally important. And we are also focusing, so um, our projects are multidisciplinary now, and a project is now looked at by multiple uh, 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 interns and fellows. So uh, once the technology is done, once the data is there for interpretation, and for a larger for a policy intervention, we also have uh, many uh, uh, very, very smart interns and fellows working on the non-science and non-technology aspect of it. Then only a comprehensive policy intervention can be done. So uh, taking this forward, uh, I also have, and we are very fortunate to have Ambassador Anup Mudgal, who was the Indian ambassador to uh, Mauritius, as I had mentioned to you earlier. But uh, his identity of uh, chairing this session is also that he is part of the uh, Prime Minister's Blue Economy Committee and also the FIKI uh, Blue Economy Task Force. And he has been part of multiple uh, top-level uh, documentation on the blue economy and the blue economy policy is going to be declared very soon and he has been a very very important component of that so i will request ambassador mudgal sir to kindly come and give his comments and uh, this is also uh, I, I want to assure you that uh, at the national level also i am working under his guidance to take this forward and i know i, I think you uh, definitely agree with me that india has a major role to play so from that perspective, I'll request uh, Ambassador Mudgal to please take over. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Vladimir. In fact, I'm, I'm really honored to be here today, uh, listening to you and then listening to Sanskar. Uh, as Arna mentioned, uh, I have now relatively a longer association with blue economy than diplomacy. I have been working on this for several years now. Uh, there, there are two aspects to my my work with blue economy. Uh, one is the policy framework part, uh, the governance part, and the other is the basically uh, the technical part, uh, which means uh, dealing with the stakeholders, uh, where we have the business community and the social aspect and then the sustainability and the environmental aspect. Uh, you know, when we started working on uh, blue economy in India, in fact, you know, not only in India, but elsewhere also, uh, uh, we thought we were the uh, kind of, uh, uh, what should we see, exclusive players when it came to uh, blue economy, but then gradually we realized we were not the the only players. Economy was only one aspect, and there was uh, there were other uh, partners to this. Which one was the uh, environmental thing, which is sustainability, and then the society part of it. So that is where, in fact, uh, I started uh, in my own way pushing uh, for the idea of MSP. Uh, you know, in India, we have been uh, kind of looking after various 
uh, aspects of uh, blue economy or oceans, uh, like the coastal zone management, is a very old uh, practice in India. And within that, you know, we also have protected zones uh, in India. And then the mangrove uh, protection program and the coral protection program. Then the riverine system protection program. So it's a, it's a, it's, it's a fair existing, fairly extensive, uh, I would say, network of programs for protection of uh, water-related affairs, including the oceans and the rivers and lakes and all that stuff. Uh, now you see uh, why, in fact, I have uh, some extra interest in MSP because having dealt with the Indian Ocean Affairs as part of Indian Ocean Rim Association, uh, you know, we thought this was a bit more complicated than dealing with these issues in, in sectoral way. Sectoral approach alone will not be able to find solutions. Uh, so that is where, in fact, you know, uh, I'm very, very happy uh, Arnab and MRC, uh, they are really paying a lot of attention to developing the scientific basis for, for helping generate the MSP framework, in fact. Um, my own expectation is that, you know, since MSP, as you rightly mentioned, is a very complex uh, a process, it will have multiple factors which will need to be monitored. And monitoring those things in itself will be a very big challenge. So uh, those, those inputs will come from very different sources. They will come from the application of satellite technology, will come from uh, the application of coastal monitoring technology, from the social aspects, and so on and so forth. M my expectation is that probably... Uh, in, in due course, Arnab, uh, we would be able to develop what is called the critical indicator modulation, in fact. Because in any given zone that we, we, we select for applying the MSP, there would be critical indicators. And these critical indicators will vary from one place to the other place, in fact. Can we, in fact, simplify the process, have, say, who knows about a dozen critical indicators, right? Uh, this could be the chemical indicators, could be the biodiversity indicators, could be the physical indicators, could be the social indicators, could be the economic indicators. Now, maybe once we, once we kind of compress the whole thing into, into critical indicators, uh, then I think it will become more understandable by the stakeholders. Because if we go to the stakeholders with such a complex thing, then they won't understand it. And normally when you don't understand a thing, you stay away from that. So my own expectation or request will be that we kind of create a system which becomes simpler for the stakeholders to understand. Uh, while the back end may be very complicated, but the front end has to be simple, right? So it's like sitting in a, in, a, in a room with a computer like you have, and there are only, say, 10 to 12 indicators. And the minute an indicator goes out of range, I will have a red signal that something is happening now, right? So as a result, you are able to take corrective measures in the, in the, in the right, right moment. And then as you mentioned, for example, this is, I'm very happy about BBNJ. Uh, I'm sure when it comes to BBNJ management, the national capacities eventually will have to be pulled into managing the open seas in terms of managing the, the, the impact of BBNJ or, or the expected outcomes for BBNJ. So I am very, very happy that this is happening. Uh, uh, we have produced a lot of reports. Uh, uh, Vladimir is part of the task force and as part of the steering committee. I will tell Arnab to maybe forward soft copies of those reports uh, to you. Uh, so that you have an idea what exactly we are doing in terms of the macro approach to ocean management. And within the macro approach, uh, the sectoral uh, uh, idea, uh, issues, including, as I say, the sustainability can be broken down into many sectoral or, or smaller components. Similarly, social aspect can be broken down into many smaller 
components and the business aspect can also be broken down into several smaller components. So we will put together these components and they come out with a, a model which is then easily understandable by the stakeholders. So that is uh, the objective and I'm sure uh, uh, MRC would be very happy to continue this process of engagement with IOC. And uh, I was happy to see there is a, uh, Anup, there is a, there is a MSP framework uh, introduced in uh, uh, Pondicherry uh, in India. So we'll see, uh, examine that uh, framework, what has been done and uh, how uh, extensive uh, and comprehensive that framework is, and then see, can we work on that framework further to, uh, to make it more comprehensive and and uh, kind of, so that we're able to answer those issues, which we expect will arise uh, once we go in for harnessing the benefits of ocean. So I think I, I congratulate you, Vladimir, for what you are doing. In fact, I have been following IOC's work uh, for many years now, and my my own initial exposure to the MSP came from your work, in fact. So when I included a little bit of uh, MSP in all the documents that we produce, uh, I would be thankful to your organization's work, which was a big guide. And I, I hope uh, th this will really evolve into uh, a, a, an effective tool for protection of the of the ocean of ocean ocean areas or ocean spaces. So I thank everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank uh, uh, Sanskar for a very comprehensive presentation. Uh, uh, I'm sure there will be many more dealing with different aspects and then coming out with 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 the as I said, critical indicators uh, for management of MSP. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency. Thank you, Ambassador Mudgal, sir. And uh, definitely, sir, uh, your points uh, are noted, and uh, we will continue with this uh, interaction and uh, discussion, and the work will definitely continue. Uh, as I said, uh, when we get into something uh, underwater, we only find that the depth is so much more and it just doesn't end. But uh, the journey has been extremely rewarding for us and we would definitely continue with this. Vladimir, thank you so much. Uh, I know it's a very early start for you, oh, but you've not... been extremely <laughs> kind. And uh, I think uh, we find, I think this interaction was important, uh, Vladimir, uh, that you, and I thank you for joining us. So at least you understand what we are doing. And uh, we are uh, doing a much larger uh, uh, event uh, uh, in, uh, in the summer uh, from June. It will be a five-week workshop. I think uh, IOC could partner us there. Uh, we have uh, multiple Indian partners, and it's a five-week program uh, where a lot of people will be there. And uh, we can even discuss with you if there is some fine-tuning required uh, from our side uh, on the larger framework that we've built. So we will continue with this, and thank you so much for joining us. And we will end this session now and look forward to the next session. And and I think uh, many people uh, globally can take the benefit of such rich interactions that have happened in this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a wonderful continuation of, of something that is really important. Just just uh, one word, you know, uh, the work of, IU, of IUC as a part of uh, United Nations is to create uh, basically a philosophical, strategic, enabling environment for you. And then breakthroughs will come. And what I see happening here is a breakthrough. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your kind words. Thank you so much. Thank you. All the best. Good afternoon, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, both online and offline. Welcome back. Uh, we are two and a half days old now. And I think uh, I'm, I take a lot of pride. I think the sessions so far have been absolutely fantastic. We have had the best of speakers. And uh, now I stand before you to present our next speaker, who's been my mentor for quite some time and uh, I think MRC has been built a lot on his 
विजडम एंड नेटवर्क श्री प्रफुल तालेरा हैज बीन इंस्ट्रूमेंटल इन आर जर्नी राइट फ्रॉम द बिगिनिंग हेज हेल्प अस not in many ways in every way possible and we both have together done enough trips enough discussions enough interactions and build the community which has supported us in whatever way or wherever we have reached now as again we don't introduce a speaker so i will request praful ji to please introduce himself i mean many people know him in any case but still for the benefit of young students who don't know him i would request uh, praful ji to kindly introduce himself and then start his presentation praful ji over to you good afternoon everyone that good food for the dummy now food for thought <laughs> thank you commander for your kind words it's been a very very satisfying journey together i mean i met commander das in the in the month of march in 2017 exactly 6 years ago and he came out of nowhere and uh, he said sir i want you to be my advisor i said i don't know what you do will you tell me a little bit of what you do so he told me something about underwater domain awareness and uh, how he built the sonar classifier for our nuclear submarine the ins aryant and i for me it was all bonkers i didn't understand anything at all of what he said so i told him that i don't understand anything of what you <laughs> are doing and how, what advice can i give you he says no no you i want you so i said i can't promise you anything but let's see what we can do all baby steps uh, that's what i believe in you know all big things start small so 6 years ago when we started we didn't know where to go how it will shape up but looking back now it's a very very satisfying journey i'm so happy that i've been associated with mrc because i had my own challenges on the work front where i was going through a <laughs> it that's just in a lighter vein but it's really been very nice building up mrc together and today we can say that we have got the support of the likes of ambassador mudgal who's been our mentor he's opened so many doors for us in delhi and he's been kind here to come and spend 3 days with us here sir thank you sir thank you <laughs> we really appreciate your presence so and we have had many more mentors like this who have been very kind you know i always used to tell commander that you now there is this phrase that no army can stop an idea whose time has come so i tweaked it a little bit and i said no navy can stop an idea whose time has come you know so i this is the first time i'm saying this in public because i was scared the navy guys might not take to it nicely who is this substart talking like this about the navy i've got a lot of respect for the navy huge respect it's not uh, in any way any way it shouldn't be taken otherwise <laughs> so but i feel that coming from the navy the perspective uh, commander das has no it's a very 360 degree perspective it's it's not sometimes we all have our blind sides we all get blinded and you know uh, develop a ten, tunnel vision and we just look at things in a very very you uh, know narrow way very myopic way so i really appreciate what the way commander das is approaches and the way he looks at the world and we become good friends you know we we've, we've traveled a lot together we go for long walks where we discuss what we need to do next so it's been very nice so to, that's about our relationship my relationship with mrc i am advisor there for the blue economy about me i i am a logistician a career logistician and uh, i did all the wrong things in life in the sense that i wanted to become an engineer ended up doing bcom wanted to go to the us to do my mba my parents didn't want me to go so i ended up doing uh, journalism and law but on hindsight i think that's how destiny wanted it to be and i'm so glad but during this journey i was always i been a student of history and geography i've always been interested and uh, history 
So I always, this one thing used to really bother me, this question, why was Pakistan created? It really, really bothered me right since my childhood. And the second thing about history, I, which really bothered me was, you know, my, and uh, this combination of history and geography got through me and the reason uh, to find out why Pakistan was created. I got involved with geopolitics. And in 2010, I was invited to become a member of IISS, the International Institute for Strategic Studies. And it's really been very heartening. Since then, I've learned a lot from all the people I've met, and I still call myself a student of history. They, uh, my business is logistics. A company, uh, Dynamic Logistics, has the credit of having put the just-in-time inventory system in place for Tata Motors, the first time it was done in India. Uh, another first to the credit of Dynamic is that we set up the first dry port in the private sector in India, and the first air cargo complex in the private sector. In fact, the policy was framed because of us. So these are the credits to Dynamic Logistics. Now, without further ado, I'll get into that presentation, please. One thing I can tell you, one, if you sit through this presentation, I can assure you, you'll never ever look at the world map in the same way again. Guaranteed, I really guarantee this. You'll never ever look at the world map in the same way again. So the theme, is, the topic is the choke points of power and the master keys that control world trade. This, this is what the British call these points. So when the British mapped the world, when the Latlong grid was born, now first it was the prime meridian, and then, so prime meridian, if we had to do it, guys from Pune, we would say it should be Pune, right? So when the British did it, they said it should be London. See, in ancient history, there have been different prime meridians. Prime meridian is a very, it's a purely arbitrary line. There's nothing like God drew that line or something. It's a purely arbitrary line uh, drawn by human beings. So there are, when the Roman Empire was there, the prime meridian was Rome. As per the Hindu calendar, it is Ujjain. So the prime meridian was mapped by the British, and that's how the Latlong grid, and that's how the GPS, right? This is the 70, 80, 90 principle. 70% of the world is water. 80% of the population lives within 200 nautical miles of the water, of the sea and the access to the sea. 80% of the population of the world. And, and in fact, it is getting lesser. Despite of global warming and the rise of the oceans and the seas, the population is moving closer and closer to the oceans. And 90% of world trade goes by sea. The cheapest form of transport is water transport. Road is almost eight times more, eight times, right? This is Sir Halford Mackinder. He is the first person to have started teaching geography as a formal subject. Before that, it was never, geography was never taught as a formal subject. We Indians said, Bu goal hai. We didn't go and prove that it is round. We just said it is goal, which is right. Nothing wrong about it. But Halford Mackinder, is the first person to have, he was the head of Department of Geography at Oxford University in the late 1800s. And not just that, today he's considered to be the father of geostrategy and geopolitics. This gentleman is considered to be the father of geostrategy. That day I heard a very interesting term for, in Hindi, first time, at the Raisina Dialogue. Who, uh, geo strategy has been called Bhu Rajniti. So that is, geo, he's the father of geo strategy and geopolitics. And not just that, he wrote a theory called the Heartland Theory. And that is exactly the reason why Ukraine is being fought for today. So hard and such a bitter fight. The world, I, I mean, you, you know, we're all scared what will happen next. It's because of Halbert Maginda. And not just that, he's the first person who understood the connect between geography and economics. He's the founder director of the London School of Economics. He's one of the founder directors of the London School of So see these hybrid subjects, geo, geopolitics, geoeconomics. Now that day I heard the foreign minister, Mr. Jai Shankar saying that everyone, every Indian is now interested in understanding India's foreign policy. Because as we get more globally integrated, Every Indian is taking interest because it's affecting our markets, it's affecting everything, our industry, our economy, everything. 
So that's why we all need to take more interest. In fact, I, I, there's a friend of mine who's just taken over as the VC of uh, Gokhale Institute. So Ajit Ranade, Dr. Ranade, I've been telling him Gokhale Institute should start a course in geopolitics and geoeconomics. Most of our universities, I, I don't think it's taught anywhere in our schools and colleges and universities. So, sir, I would urge you to please send, let us spread this message that we should teach geopolitics and geoeconomics. Boo Rajniti. <laughs> so this is the human meridians, which are used in our ancient shastras, you know, and the pressure points and all. So that's when the British, when they mapped the world and the lat long grid was born, they realized there are 11 points on the world map, which if you control, you can control world trade, all the geopolitics of the world, all the geoeconomics of the world is linked to these points. So I'll take you through a brief history of these things next. So that's the prime meridian and the lat long grid. Next. And this is Admiral John Fisher. He served on a ship called the HMS Calcutta. Her Majesty's service, Calcutta. And when he died, he wrote in his will that he should be buried near the hull of the HMS Calcutta. So that's where he has been buried. And he is the gentleman who identified these 11 points. He's considered to be the second most influential uh, naval leader of the UK after Lord Nelson. Lord Nelson fought for the choke point of Gibraltar and that's where, so when his body was taken, the, the nation, UK celebrated and cried, the Queen cried for the death of Nelson, uh, Lord Nelson. So John Fisher uh, identified these choke points so these are the 11 choke points. I'll tell you. A choke point is, if anyone has seen how a dog is trained, they use a choke. They literally, it's like a fasi ka fanda. Usko choke karo, and that's it. So all military strategy, all naval strategy is choke points. And in fact, in every, in so many spheres of our life, this is how it goes. So it'll be very instructive if you ever get a chance to go and see a dog training session. Here at the police ground, they have a dog training session. Please go and see it. We are not very different. There's a Russian scientist, Anton Pavlov, who studied dogs and their psychology, how they are trained, and these techniques are used in the armies of the world even today. Anton Pavlov. So these are the 11 choke points of the world. I've related them to our cities. And most of them are tax havens as well. All the money of the world is, moves through these points. So I'll take you through from left to right, from the west to east. The first one is next, Panama. The Panama Canal, so both these canals, the Panama Canal and the Suez Canal were conceived by the French, initiated by the French, but the Panama they couldn't build, the Americans came and completed it. So the, and that's where the city of Panama is. You must have heard and read about the Panama Papers. So many of our Indian politicians, including Amitabh Bachchan also was, and Nawaz Sharif are all involved with the Panama Papers. So we don't know how it affects our economy, but that's there for you to ponder. Next. So Panama Canal is like a, it's like a step, a ladder, a ladder from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. So ships have to be taken up and then kept down. That's how it is. It's a system of locks. There are seven locks. It's very interesting to see how a ship is, uh, goes through the canal. They've just recently do doubled the size of the canal. So this is the Panama Canal between the Atlantic and the so Panama City. See, Panama is choked. You have to go right around Cape Horn, which is impossible. Cape Horn is considered to be the Mount Everest of the Capes. It's impossible to navigate the big ships. Big ships don't use those. It's not a route for voyages. So Cape Horn is out. Uh, no sailboats can go through there. So there is a possibility to build another canal because there's so much traffic there. It's literally worse than Pune traffic. Chock a block, the ships are waiting to get in queue to go through the canal. Because that's the only way you can get from the Atlantic to the Pacific and the other way around as well. So there's a possibility to build a Nicaragua canal. So all these contras and Nicaragua and Iran deals and everything, sir, you're talking about it yesterday, is linked to this. It's linked to this. 
and this was considered before the Panama Canal was built. Now the Chinese have given a proposal to put in $50 billion. It's a Hong Kong company, and they want to build it. So, but there's a lot of politics before it will get built. We don't know whether it will get built or not. See, all the drug money of across the US and everything. So yeah, see, if Panama is choked, you know, this is the route you have to take. So America would need two navies, one for the Atlantic coast and one for the Pacific coast. Just imagine the cost if Panama is choked. And this is a, it's an impossible route. You can't take. The first guy to have navigated around there was Ferdinand Magellan, who went around and circumnavigated the globe. He couldn't finish the journey, he died. But yes, his crew completed the journey. He was the first person. And he took this route also from next. This is the southernmost city in the world, Ushuaia. And that's where a lot of, uh, if you want to go to Antarctica, you'll have to go to Ushuaia, and then they'll take you from there. Ushuaia and Cape Horn, next. So this is the route which Ferdinand Magellan took. You know, see those red arrows? The Straits of Magellan, they're called the Straits of Magellan. And the Drake Passage. Drake Passage was, the guy, uh, Francis Drake was a pirate who saved the British and Queen Elizabeth from the, Spaniard, the Spanish Armada. So that is named after him. These are all the pirates. <laughs> Next. So this is the state of, this is a satellite photograph of the state of Magellan. Next. Yeah, next, next. Now these are the Falkland Islands. These islands are 8,000 kilometers away from London, but the UK will not give it up. They have gone to war, they have threatened the Argentinians. The, uh, the Argentinians call them Malvinas, the island of Malvinas. And they have threatened the Argentinians with a nuclear, they sent in, they deployed the nuclear submarine and they said, if you don't back up, we'll blow you out. So that is the extent to which if anyone wants to tamper with these points, this is where you know, it could lead to a third world war. Ukraine might not lead to a third world war, but <laughs> this could. Next. This is the rock of Gibraltar. In ancient Greek mythology, they are called the pillars of Hercules. They are called the pillars of Hercules. This is also a tax haven. This mountain is full of artillery. They have hollowed it from inside. There are a lot of guns inside there. I have been there. Next. This is the only entry and exit from the Atlantic into the Mediterranean and vice versa. There is no other way to go. There is absolutely no other way. And this is where the British won against the Sp Spaniards. And that's how they won it. And now the Spaniards have been begging, threatening, everything possible, but the Brits are not willing to. It's just a seven and a half kilometer, square kilometer piece of rock. That's it. But it's British territory and a tax haven. Next. This is it. That airstrip is UK and this side is Spain. That's it. The Rock of Gibraltar. And from the other side, from the Rock of Gibraltar, you can see Africa. You can see Morocco on the other side. On a clear day, you can see Africa. Next. The fourth one is the Straits of Dover, the English Channel. Half the shipping traffic of the world goes through the English Channel. And one of the reasons why the Brits have chosen to do a Brexit is because all the big ports of, the, of Europe are upstream. So they can choke them all here. Hamburg, Antwerp, and Rotterdam can be choked here. So British have this leverage, and that's why they've exited Britain. There is something behind there which we don't understand. They can choke all the cargo in Europe. All the three big ports of Europe are ahead, up there. Next. This is, you can see the white cliffs of Dover. That's England from France. This view is from France into England, the white cliffs of Dover. Next. The fifth point is the Danish Straits, Denmark. Recently, it was in the news. Uh, now, Denmark is the Baltic Sea. And the Russians, if they do, can't get out of here, they can't enter the Atlantic. So Denmark was won by the British again here. And 
the biggest shipping line of the world is headquartered in Copenhagen here in Denmark. I used to always wonder, how come, why did a, the biggest shipping line of the world come out of Denmark? Tiny little nation, but this is the reason. Because every Russian submarine, everything can be controlled and choked here in Denmark. So these are all small, small islands, and that's it. Next. Yeah, that's Copenhagen. Copenhagen is Copenhagen, and that's the only route you can take. There's no other way. Next. This is the famous mermaid, and recently she was in the news because someone went, some, vandalized, some guys vandalized it and painted the Russian flag on it, on the rock blue, just two, three days back. It was in the news. So this mermaid was sitting on a Russian flag. I don't know who did it. <laughs> and everyone's wondering who did it. Next. The fifth is, the sixth one is Istanbul. See, Istanbul became Istanbul in 1453. Till then, it was Constantinople. And it was Mehmed the second, Mehmed the first, who won Istanbul in, the, in 1453 and pushed back the Eastern Roman Empire. That was the end of the Eastern Roman Empire. And it's the Eastern Roman Empire, the Orthodox Church of the Eastern Roman Empire, which went into Russia. They draw all their lineage from this church, the Russians. And this is very significant for us Indians, 1453. Within 40 years of the fall of Istanbul, the Americas were discovered by Christopher Columbus trying to come to India. And within 50 years, Vasco de Gama landed on our shores, within 50 years of the fall of Istanbul. Till then, the, the route was the land route. And because they started extracting more heavier tolls, it became unviable. And that is why the Portuguese and the Spaniards who were outermost on the Atlantic ventured out to sea, trying to find a route to India. So this is it again. This whole Ukraine, Crimea, everything is because of the state. And that is the leverage which the Turks have over Russia and over, uh, over the rest of it. See, Turkey is not a NATO uh, country, but it's a major non-NATO ally. It's a major non-NATO ally. Yeah, so, but it's a major, the status is a... Yeah, they're not part of the European Union, but yes, they're part of NATO. Sorry. I would put it that way. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Thank you for correcting, sir. So here you can see the white is the Black Sea. Sorry. <laughs> the colors all. So, and there, the, that, the island there is the Crimea. That is where the fighting is to control the Crimea. Crimea is always part of Russia, though. It's a very ancient history which goes thousands of years. Ukraine and Russia. And, but the Russians need that. It's very, very strategic for them because, see, Russia, the problem of Russia is it's, a, it's the largest country in the world, even today, even after the breakup of the Soviet Union. You know, to give you an idea of what Russia is, the size of Russia, India is one and a half time zones. We made it one time zone for the matter of convenience, for the sake of convenience, one time zone. Russia is 11 time zones. It's right from Japan here, from Alaska, you know, that side, right into Europe. It's 11 time zones. Can you imagine the expanse of Russia? We are one and a half. There are 11 time zones. For convenience, they made it nine time zones. The problem of Russia is it's got everything in industrial quantity, huge wealth. Massive amount of everything possible in industrial quantities. The problem is it's virtually landlocked. The ports are frozen eight to nine months in a year. So what do you do? How do you take that cargo out? How do you evacuate? So they can be choked here in Istanbul. Half the city of Istanbul is in Asia, half, it is in, half of it is in Europe. That's how it is positioned. Next. This is Istanbul. Yeah, this will give you a big picture of the things. See, the dark green is the Greek islands. So the shipping of the world is owned by the Greeks, the Norwegians, and the Danes. And the guys who man them are the Chinese, the Indians, and the uh, Filipinos. Now the Chinese have got into the game. They have also become big shipping owners. The Koreans are there. The Japanese are there. 
but still by and large this is how it is so the those green dark green is the islands of greece see the white there is the baltic you can see copenhagen there you have this pointer okay okay no problem right the white up there is the baltic the white here this side is the black sea and you can see spain and portugal right out there there is gibraltar the dover straits the english channel and there are four choke points here the four choke points there next okay this is see that's where istanbul is next to greece greece again is the mother of western civilization whether it goes bankrupt or whatever it is they will care never give give up on greece it's a very strategic location extremely strategic they can't still the trust the turks the turks call the european union a christian club they call it a christian club they, now they said they've given up on the idea of trying to become a member of the european union <laughs> <laughs> next so this is the suez canal the suez canal next year yeah, just you can see this is a big picture yeah go ahead next yeah this is see this is like two fingers of yours the longer one is the suez canal and the other one is the this is the gulf of suez and the gulf of aqaba aqaba is a port in jordan the, the, that and that's where israel is at the tip israel is the size of pune district exactly the size of pune district and the population of pune district 8 million people i went to israel in two delegations in the homeland security delegation and the cyber security delegation it's a tiny little place it's like a lab it's literally like a lab fantastic ideas everything so the israelis were telling us we got all the great ideas of the world we got the brains of both the superpowers the americans and the russians that's what they told us we got the brains of both the superpowers the americans and the russians and now we've got such great ideas so where do we scale them up how do we scale these ideas now the americans are have plateaued out the chinese we don't trust them so they're looking at india how to scale ideas so we are a big market 1.4 billion people and that's how the israelis look at india next sorry we just go back i'll just i just want to tell you one more thing see there is a possibility see the idea of israel was born during the first world war during the currency of the war in the in 1917 there was a bill in parliament in the british parliament which was moved it was called the declaration of balfour and they decided that the jews are being persecuted much before the second world war before hitler did whatever he did and said no they they should get a homeland of their own so the idea was born in 1917 and implemented in after the second world war because there is a possibility to build another canal there it's called the red sea red sea canal because see when the suez got choked recently the whole shipping of the world went for haywire Yeah, I mean, it's been it's taken months. Even now, it's still not normalized in the true sense of the word, because one ship got blocked in the Suez Canal, and the shipping of the world went for a toss. Next, so to control these choke points, they will go to any extent, any extent. There's no limits, absolutely no limits. This is the Suez Canal, a satellite photograph. Next, the city of Suez. Next, next. This is the Red Sea, Red Sea Canal. They they build. It's part of the peace plan for the Palestinians, and if it works out, that's it. The Red Sea, Red Sea proposed pipeline, because they are worried about environmental reasons. Because the Red Sea is low, is the lowest point on Earth. <coughs> Even if you don't know how to swim, you will, will not sink there, because the salt water content is such that you will float. Next. Yeah, this is, and this was all surveyed in 1915, huh? much before. 1915, all these surveys were done, the route of the canal. Next, next. See, this is how it all goes. So, this is another option for the Swiss Canal. Next. Yeah, you see, yeah, you can see that very clearly. Gulf of Suez, Gulf of Aqaba, and that triangle is Jordan, uh, Israel. Next. 
This is Aden, which is south of Yemen. I live in a house which used to be called, it's a 100 year old house, which used to be called Aden Villa. And built by a Parsi gentleman who went from Surat just after the Suez Canal was opened up. And uh, as an ordinary tailor, he started to set up shop there and he became the, became the biggest ship handling agent on the East African coast. So Aden was the first port of call after Bombay for the British. So this route from Bombay, Aden, Suez, Gibraltar, and London. This was the shortest route from London to India, and it was called the lifeline to India by the Britishers. It was called the lifeline to India. See, I always say we need to go deeper. So this is Aden. Aden is in a defunct volcano. Next. The major civil war going on there. This is the entry into the Red Sea. That's where Aden is. Opposite there is Djibouti. Djibouti used to be a French colony. And now the Chinese have got a base there. And they're building a bridge across from Djibouti into, from Africa into Asia. Aden is in Asia. Djibouti is in Africa. And uh, it's a $10 billion contract already awarded by the Americans. I, I don't know, I just can't figure it out on myself. And it's called the Bridge of Horns. They're building twin cities there. They call the uh, Al Noor cities, the city of lights. And the contract has been awarded, guess to whom? One of the biggest construction companies of the world. Any guesses? No, the Bin Laden construction company. <laughs> <laughs> the contract has gone to the Bin Laden construction company. And these cities will rival Dubai. Work is on. Construction work is on. The Al Noor cities, one in Africa, one in Yemen. And that's why the civil war again there. There are a lot of reasons when you go deeper, the more you'll understand. I'm just giving you an introduction to this subject actually. Next. This is Dubai on the Gulf of Hormuz a little bit inside. There are a lot of sensors out there to ch check out what's happening. Next. This is what India, Iran, and Russia are building. And there's a lot of, uh, they, they expect a huge amount of cargo away by the, in the next six, seven years on this. This is the shortest route into Central Asia. Kazakhstan is the largest landlocked country in the world. And this, we, Iranian railways has helped Iran double track their railways. There's a port there called Chabar, which India has built. We have put in more than $200 million there. I've been to Chabar myself. And that is the entry into Afghanistan. See, and this is what the Chinese have built. Just 170 kilometers away from Chabar is Gwadar, Parallel, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. So these are two ports right there in the Persian Gulf, deep sea ports, one built by the Chinese, one built by the Indians. We are in Iran, they are in Pakistan. And this is why the Kargil War also happened, the Karakoram Highway, and POK and all that. This is all, all the, like, if you have the questions of history, you'll understand if you understand geography. There's a whole network being built of highways with the Chinese are calling the Belt and Road Initiative and a whole lot of things. Next. The Trans-Asian Railways. See, the Chinese have moved cargo from China into Germany by train, but it's, I told, like I told you, tr uh, road transport is very expensive. It's the most expensive. Rail is cheaper, but still, how many rakes can you move? One rake has got 40. If you double track, double, it's 80. But a ship can take 20 containers. A railway can take 80 containers. Next. This is the Cape of Good Hope. The Portuguese reached here in seven years of the fall of Constantinople, but they couldn't navigate the Cape. It took them a lot, 30 years more, to understand how to navigate the Cape. Because it's a very, very rough waters. Ships pitch and roll at the same time here. That's how the waters are. Next. This is Cape Town. And the 11 choke is the Straits of Malacca. See, in the in, during the Second World War, Winston Churchill was in a dilemma, whether to let Singapore fall to the Japanese or to let London fall to the Germans. So he said, let Singapore fall. 
and Singapore fell, and London was saved, and UK was saved. <laughs> so the Straits of Malacca, there's a lot of piracy there, and here there is this island of Bali here, near the Lombok Straits. So the bigger ships which cannot go through Malacca, you know ships are classified as Malacca Max, Panamax, Suez Max. That's how ships are classified, with, with, through which they can go through the canals. Next, yeah. This is Singapore. Yeah, next. And this is Bali. Bali is a Hindu island in a Muslim country. The culture of Bali is all Hindu even today, despite of hundreds of years of Islamic rule there. And there's a reason. We Indians controlled it. Raja Rajendran Chola controlled it a thousand years ago. There's a lot of trade there. There's Ganpati and Lakshmi and Saraswati. In fact, if you understand Bhasa Indo Indonesia, Bhasa Indonesia, if you really pay attention, you can understand most of it because it's all Sanskrit based. Bhasa Indonesia, most Indians will be able to understand if you pay a little attention. Next. Yeah, next. So there's a possibility to build another canal here in the Isthmus of Kra. That's where Burma and Thailand and Malaysia cross. So there's a possibility to build a canal. The Chinese are willing to build it again, but there are a lot of issues. There are a lot of insurgency, a lot of problems. Maybe the Rohingya issue. So many issues are linked to this. Because the, the Chinese won't have to go through the Straits of Malacca. See, for us, the Indian Navy, the Malacca choke is the most important choke. Because our Andaman Nicoba Islands are there. That's how we keep a track of the Chinese. And it takes the Chinese 14 days to come into the Indian Ocean from China. And that's why we can choke them. Next. See, this is how the oil of the world flows. This is the choke points. This is how the, the flow of the oil. Next. And this is how the undersea internet cables, to link it up with what MRC is doing. See, there is no other way to go. That's how geography, you have. see, we keep saying that change is the only constant. I beg to differ. Geography is a constant, and human nature is a constant. We all want to be alpha. We all want to be alpha. If you look at the history of the world, there have been many empires. America is the most recent one. They've been the Persian Empire, the Mongol Empire, the British and Egyptian empires, huge empires, which were invincible in their days. So the Spaniards, the Portuguese empires. So if you take it in perspective, America has been there for 100 years now. You don't know who will come next. We're already talking about multipolarity. From a bipolar world, USSR, America, to a unipolar moment, and now the Multipolarity is being discussed. It's some time away still. Uh, I wanted to be uh, with you till the end and ask you some difficult questions. <laughs> but I'll spare you. <laughs> no, it was really a great pleasure being here. And I, I learned a lot listening to the presentations. I'm sure we'll have many more opportunities of joining together in such functions. And maybe more people here will also understand the importance of what MRC is doing. And then probably will want to uh, contribute their knowledge to the whole process. This is a very interesting topic which Raful is discussing. In fact, uh, they have, you know, you said to, I should say why things happen. So, you know, causes of things. Why, why a certain behavior you see uh, in a society, in an individual, in a country, globally. There are reasons behind that. And how the geopolitics have behaved or has behaved in the past, uh, these are the reasons for that behavior. People went all the way, they, they paid heavy prices in terms of life and material and money, only to sit on those gates, because these were the gates and those who controlled these gates, you said 11, I'll say 12, maybe one more if you can add a couple of more. If you sit on those gates, you are the 
controller of those highways, right? So I'm sure people must understand more. We should teach our people more of these things. Because otherwise, when we do certain things, the ordinary people say, Hum kyu kar rahe? Oh, that's, it's very far off. Why are we going there? Right? So you mentioned, for example, this is our connection to Central Asia through Iran and uh, China coming all the way down through Pakistan. And an ordinary person is not able to understand why they're doing it. Right? Now, if you have to avoid those choke points, you have to find find a what is your plan B. <laughs> right? These are all investments into plan B. They may never use it. Right? So, I I really wish you all the best. Uh, no, uh, this is a bit way. So, sorry, I'm leaving. Wish you all the best. <laughs> I thank you all, please. Thank you so much. Yes, always. So this is how the cables of the world go. The Russians have threatened it. See that they would cut these cables. And you can know there was a disruption and we didn't have internet services for a few days in between. See, the Americans have gone and blown up the Nordstrom. Now you can imagine what the Russians could do if things get worse. See, it could go to any extent. See, they have already threatened, the Russians have already threatened that the Americans should not forget that they have a soft underbelly in Texas. That's where all the oil refineries are and that's where... So, you don't know. These things are possible, but we need to understand how... This is the structural view of things. Once you understand this, this is like seminal reading. You, you know, once you understand this, a lot of things will fall in place. And I, I can promise you now, you'll never look at the world map in the same way again. You'll never ever look at the world map in the same way again. Next. See, this is, look, I, yesterday I was saying about India's position on the world map. We are a blessed country. God is an Indian. I'm convinced God is an Indian. Look at the location of India. No other country has a better location than this. No other country in the world has a better location a geostrategic location than India. We are the only country in the world with an ocean named after it. You know what's my mission? I was asked to introduce myself. I forget to tell you the how I introduce myself. I call myself a cyber coolie because I'm a logistician. And my mission in life is to build or to enable or whatever little I can do, Kharisa Vata in Marathi, to build a Samudra Bharat. Because unless we become a Samudra Bharat, we cannot be a Samruddha Bharat. We cannot be. It's period. You cannot be a Samruddha Bharat if you don't become a Samudra Bharat. So this is it. This is India and the Indian Ocean. The only country with an ocean named after it. Next. But we don't look at it. Just take two minutes to read this. Just take a moment. This was reported in the Indian Express in 2009. The date also is there. The Chinese had made an offer to the Americans that why don't you take the Pacific and give the Indian Ocean to us. They're trying to deal, do a deal over the Indian Ocean. The problem with us is because we are a continent, we have a, no, a subcontinent, we have a continental culture, whereas we should have a maritime culture also because we have got an ocean named after us. The Chinese refuse to call the Indian Ocean the Indian Ocean. They call it the Western Ocean. And if we don't claim it, we can't blame anyone today. We have to wake up to the ocean. You know, I always give this example. In 1498, Vasco da Gama landed on Indian shores, opening up the route for the Europeans to come. And they all came. The French came, the Dutch came, the British came, the Portuguese, every, I mean, after the Portuguese, everyone came, right? In 1998, they celebrated 500 years of the voyage to India. They built a big memorial in Lisbon, Vasco da Gama, I've been there. 500 years later, they built this big memorial to Vasco da Gama in Lisbon. In 10, 10 years later, in 2008, we had Ajmal Kasab coming by a fishing boat from Pakistan and taking over Bombay. In 510 years, we have not woken up yet. That is the tragedy. As a culture, we need to wake up, as every Indian needs to be aware that we need to be seafaring as well. We need to be looking at our ocean. This is, a, I'm just stating a fact. Next. See how you look at the world. That's what the world is. 
See, there is no strategy. Strategy always comes out of the big picture. Strat unless you take the big picture view, you will never be strategic in your thinking. Never, ever. So remember, strategy is also a game of deception. There are many definitions of strategy. But strategy is a big picture view of the world. The, you know, they have this blue ocean thinking and you know, a whole lot of sessions. And so that's how you look at the world is what we receive is what we perceive. That's how the world is. Next year. This, uh, this was said by the guy who wrote the American Doctrine of the American Navy, Admiral Alfred Thierman. This is what he said 100 years ago. 100 years ago, an American said this. Next. And this is it. I end my presentation here. We have time for questions. Time. Any questions, anything under the sun, I'll try to answer now. <laughs> so once you understand this, you'll understand a lot of things. See, all the undersea, that's how I, because of my interest in geopolitics, I was roped in by a commander. That's how I've been working for the last six years in the Maritime Research Center. And the underwater domain, see, we haven't understood our waters. See, the Americans believe that, you know, the global commons, there are three global commons. What is a global common? How is it defined? A global common is that domain, that area, over which no one can have ownership, over which no country has sovereignty. Like ma'am said in the morning, the waters don't belong to anyone. The waters belong to everyone. How do you divide water? How do you divide a weather system? Or how, how can you say the monsoon is ours? I mean, it's, there's no way. Right? So, how do you... So the underwater domain is one of the least understood of the domains. So which are the three global commons? The blue waters, the international waters of India, the you know, territorial jurisdiction of India is 12 and a half nautical miles. After that, it is the international waters. Second is outer space. And third is cyberspace. So the Americans believe that if you can control these global commons, or if not control them, at least dominate them, they can assure American dominance for the next 200 years. It's a stated policy of the Americans. So if they think like this, what are we doing? What are we thinking? And how should we go about it? If we want to become Vishwa Guru, whatever, we want to become a powerful nation, a Samudra Bharat, Samruddha Bharat, what do we need to do? So we need to pay attention to our waters. Next. See, China has already built a string of pearls, they is called. Motioka Har, Penadi Amko Hindustan Yoko. Yes, we have counted it with a necklace of diamonds. Next. See, that's Hamantota, Gwadar, then there is Djibouti here, the Chittagong. This is, this is all the Chinese ports which they have built. They call it the pearls, pearl, a string of pearls. Next. This is India's necklace of diamonds to counter the Chinese. This is what we have done. Yeah, next. Yeah. So this is now, see the, <coughs> the Americans changed the Asia Pacific into Indo Pacific. It happened during our lifetime, very recently. Right? So, what is the Indo Pacific? The Indo Pacific is the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. So, who's central? Now, that's how the cord was born. Is the Japanese, the Australians, India, and the Americans across the Pacific supporting us to contain China? That is what the quad is. You see that belly of China? So there is Japan there, this is Australia and India. So from the east coast of Africa to the west coast of the US, that is the Indo Pacific. Next. So what is India doing? How are we countering this? Our major ports, we've got 12 major ports and 200 minor ports. So India is privatizing its ports. Next. And that's how the Sagar Mala, port-led development, port-led prosperity. Next. The Sagar Mala project. Next. 
the major rivers 111 rivers of india have been declared like national highways have been declared as national waterways 20000 kilometers of indian rivers will be opened up for traffic for cargo as well as for passenger traffic you can imagine the opportunity there huge opportunity all the ships and barges and uh, cruise liners and everything the prime minister recently announced the uh, mb sagar or mb ganga in ganga vilas which went from uh, banaras to dibrugarh via the uh, water route all the passengers the swiss nationals most of them acting 20000 km we have never used our waterways for transport you know i'll tell you a historical example the magadh empire which was partly putra the bihar modern day bihar they always wanted to control ujjain which is central asia the central india sorry right there in the heart of india near indore ujjain why because ujjain is on the river shipra and shipra is a tributary of the narmada which empties into the gulf of khambat is the gulf of cambay at baruch and from baruch they could trade with the roman empire the magadh empire was trading with the roman empire using our indian rivers the coastal waters and that's how it was to more than 2000 years ago what have we been doing we've lost so much of this knowledge morning we had a very good session by dr radhika's session fantastic session and now and she has such a fine understanding of what it is it's, it's available on the net no? yes will be available on the mrc website please do watch it i urge you to please watch it next this is our exclusive economic zone which is almost the size of the territory of india the land territory of india it's almost the size of india next and these are our waters so all the seabed mining everything all the opportunities in the blue economy yesterday we were discussing last two days all the opportunities on the floor of the ocean the fisheries the oil and gas all the gas hydrates everything is there in the ez and so that's why the india the government of india has taken this initiative we have created this indian ocean rim association next yeah see this is the indian ocean and the countries we have got 44 countries who are our neighbors see land border we share with eight countries but 44 countries are just across the indian ocean and it's cheaper to send a container like i told you from chennai to port elizabeth which is the tip of south africa then to move it from chennai to delhi bombay to pune is more expensive than bombay to singapore can you believe this a container can be sent cheaper from bombay to singapore than moving it from bombay to pune that's how expensive it is ko land this friction it has to be drawn two containers can go on a trailer on a truck one container a ship carries 20000 containers 20 those ships cannot even come into jnpt so all our cargo gets hopped into colombo and that's how it goes we don't have a deep sea port yes the mundra has come up so this is the rim and if you look at it see the whole of east africa is english speaking thanks to the british the whole of east africa is english speaking except for a few countries like madagascar or something most countries are english speaking countries because they are all part of the commonwealth three more than 3 million people in africa are of indian origin more than 3 million people all from the south so many of them 3 million people that's how the population of pune in africa is indian if you go to the gulf tamil is official language in singapore in malaysia and in sri lanka the third largest population in australia is indian so just imagine if this diaspora is activated and we start trading bengal the bangladesh is fully bengali if you go to pakistan is urdu urdu is you can understand most of pakistani tv if you listen to it 80 90% of the language is what we understand and hindi movies are a big hit in pakistan so if just look at the indian diaspora look at the indian the location there amazing we are a blessed country we are a tropical paradise if only we bother to wake up and <laughs> take charge of it and we have been see the, the look at the history of the world 
The first port in the world is in India, Lothal. They built a museum now. The prime minister was there to lay the foundation stones and all that. Lothal is the first port in the world, 7,000 years ago. The first port during the Mohenjo-Daro-Harappa civilization. That's it. Thank you so much. Any questions? We still have 15, 20 minutes. Hello. Yes, sir. I'm audible. Sir, excellent lecture, wonderful. I uh, gave a lot of knowledge and uh, you know broadened the region. The, the first basic question came in mind. These things, as you mentioned, geospatial, uh, geopolitics, and geo. This thing is such an important, very important topic. You should taught in the school level. Yes, sir. Yes, I agree. Master's degree and that is okay, but <laughs> we really don't have that much, uh, in, you know, in uh, understanding of these subject, these topics in at school level, basic level. So that, in a simplified manner, should be at a school level and then... So my friend here, Dr. Vijay Pillai, he's sitting in your row only. He runs a school in Kondwa, the yeah. Sangre schools. He called me, I went and spoke to the students. Uh, I'm student. open for me, this is a mission in life. Any school, any college wants me to come and talk on this subject, I go and do it for free. Yeah, yeah. great, great. That so I want here. to spread this word. Now, you, I'm sure it is, it'll change your perception and your thinking. <laughs> So I am available, sir. Now I put this presentation together on a trek. Actually, we used to go for treks. My friends used to tell me, Praful, na, there's one Dr. Bhave, Shirish Bhave. No, he said, Tasana hai re, tu ek PowerPoint presentation bana. So he got after me, and because of him, I made this presentation. And because of this presentation, I met so many friends like you. I got to know so many people, right from General Shekhatkar to everyone. Commander came to me because of this, maybe. Because he heard. Uh, so this is how I, he came and discovered me. So yeah, I'm very happy. Anything... I, I feel it should be taught in every school. It should be part of a curriculum. But I don't know. I can't set the <laughs> curriculum. This was an amazing presentation. It's a pictorial and he showed us some special things on map. So it uh, gave all the, everything, you know, talking points. And you showed the importance. Uh, with, with the help of that dog and everything. Thank you, it sir. Thank so you. clear, clear. My God, oh my God, it is. You know, there is the there are two uh, two Indians, huh? Who have gone and round the world. There is a project called the Sagar Parikrama, which was launched by the Indian Navy, and there are two Indians who have gone solo around the world in a sailing vessel. The first person is Commander Dilip Donde, and the second is Commander Abhilash Tomi, both from the Indian Navy. Both are good friends of Commander and myself. And you know, they, they should be, you know, how many of you have heard of Commander Dundi? No one knows. See, we all know Sachin Tendulkar. See, we want to be great. We need more people like Dilip Dundi. Dilip Dundi has to be a national hero. I keep telling Dilip, Dilip, India needs a hero. You know, I, I have a Maritime Culture Foundation. I want to make a movie on Dilip Dundi so that India knows him and more people follow him to the ocean. So, see, we need to build the, that. See, no one knew about Milka Singh till that movie came. Most Indians didn't know about Milka Singh. And Milka Singh didn't even get a gold medal or any medal in the Rome Olympics. He came fourth. And Dilip Donde is there. He was the first Indian to have, rig if you just Google the first Indian, Dilip Donde, he's the first Indian to have gone and circumnavigated the globe and we don't know him. You ask anyone, you know, do you know Dilip Dhande? Most fellows say, who is this guy? We should be celebrating such stories. See, we, are, we have to... You no, know, we need role models. And if we have the right role models, people will follow. So this is... Anything else? Next. Yeah, please. Yes, Rishikesh. Rishikesh bad ke both notes banata hai. Please. <laughs> Sir, uh, I have two doubts. Uh, First, as you explained, like all for diamond. But uh, my question is, sir, China is using policies like debt, tra debt trap policies, and the recent developments in Sri Lanka, Djibouti, Mauritius, and also the revival of Silk Road. And in this case, how far we are, uh, how far we will be able to control the China's hegemony in this case? And considering its uh, defense expenditure is second in number after USA, so. It's okay that we are doing uh, various uh, platforms, like we are using various platforms like Quad and many other, but how far we'll be able to do that and what will be the direction of our steps? So, <laughs> no, sure. See, it's not that India is not doing enough. 
See, Sagar Parikrama, this program was launched by the Indian Navy. And when they said, now you need to build a ship, a sailboat in India, not a ship, a sailboat in India, we didn't know how to build a boat. If you listen to Dilip Donde, he said, we didn't, India didn't know how to build a boat, which will go around the world and come back. So they like started searching for things. He was tasked with it. Because he was the only guy who volunteered. Koi marne tha, he's the only guy. He said, ah, main jata And Abhilash, as we talk, is going around the world in the Golden Globe race. You can track him. There are only four guys left now. The rest have all dropped out. Acha, yes, good. <laughs> so you can track him now. <laughs> So that's what is happening. These are small green shoots in India, which give us great hope. And it's not that, see, we've been a great civilization. We are a civilization, not a, we are a young nation. We are a 75 year old nation, but a 7,005 year old civilization maybe, or maybe more. So if we tap into our civilization roots, see going forward, you know what I believe is that India's genius lies in how we connect our past to our present to build a better future. If we Indians can do this, like in the morning, see, even Ambassador Mudgal said that, see, if we can combine our traditional technologies, traditional knowledge to technology, India has got going. India is on its way to achieve its full potential. And we have everything here. What do I, what, I mean, God has blessed us like no other country in the world. You show me a better country than this. We are the original melting pot. See, there are Indians here who look like Africans, who are of African origins, but speak Gujarati, who speak uh, Kannada. They look like Africans. They are of African origins. The Siddhis, if you just Google Siddhis in Karnataka, uh, there is a tribe in, uh, near the Gir Forest, Gujarat. There are Indians who look like Chinese. There are Indians who look like Europeans. They look like, I mean, look at the shape and size of Indians. We are the original melting pot. The Americans call themselves a melting pot. They're not even 200 years old. We are a few thousand year old melting pot. Thousands of years, you don't know how much of blood has mixed here in this country. We are the greatest hybrids in the world, I say. <laughs> you know, so we have really got a tremendous, we just need to tap into the right things and put the things in place and this country can fly. And we have come to that moment now. See, it's been 75 years in trying to build up this nation. Everyone has contributed. Think big picture, think how we can do it, how you can build yourself, what you can contribute. If we can do this, I'm sure we'll be able to achieve India's potential. I am doing my bit for Samudra Bharat, Samruddha Bharat. Yes, anyone next? Yes, Rajesh. Mike, 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 Mike. You mentioned about Lothal. Huh. No, Lothal, I saw it a month before. There, there was a port or yeah. 2,000 years before there. 7,000 port, yes. Ah. <laughs> and now there is a bead factory, like huh. Hambat, huh. where these precious stones uh, could be seen. Yeah. And uh, one stone could be got after uh, around 2,000 tons. And now there is only a port and a small pond. But all there is uh, no ruins. Even the museum has been shifted from there. Yeah, yeah, that's what Modi ji had, was there recently. See, Lothal is 7,000 years old. It's the first dockyard in the world. If you go in Lothal, L-O-T-H-A-L, Lothal. And what has happened is, see, like exactly what Commander keeps talking about, what we talk about in MRC, sedimentation. See, the seas have moved in. There's a lot of erosion of the coastlines. A lot of things happen. See, we lost Dwarka also, right? We all know Krishna, even Lord Krishna couldn't save Dwarka, right? So there, you know, Command, uh, Ambassador Mudgala is saying the amount of marine archaeology in our waters, if we put it, all the museums of the world will not be able to take them in. That is the amount of material lying there. On our seabeds, coastal seabeds. Uh, that's a World Heritage Site. No? Yeah, I know Lothal. I've been there. So, see, Lothal, if you go to the east coast of Orissa, you know, there was Bali Jatra. I went for Bali Jatra. You know what is Bali Jatra? This is the biggest festival in Orissa. The first full moon after Diwali. That's this Kartik Purnima. They celebrate this. 
So what they do is they make small models of boats, and where the Mahanadi meets the Bay of Bengal, you float it. It's it's a very significant. It's a, just a symbolic thing now. A lot of people. I was very happy being there. Very sad being there. Very few people know that anything you launch there at that point of the year, time in the year will auto, the current in the ocean is such in the Bay of Bengal is such it will automatically take you to Bali. The current is such that it, your boat will automatically go to Bali, Indonesia. That is why I mentioned Bali. Now, how many Indians know this? I I was I I you know and the the, the museum in Katak there, very close to Bhubaneswar Katak. There, there are records that we have carried elephants on those boats. What a lovely museum! One of the finest museums I have seen in India. A small museum, very well built by the British again, of course. But we have carried elephants on those boats. Can you imagine what the size of the boat must be to carry an elephant? Because that fellow is not going to be a statue there. Ki bahut silne ka nahi, right? You have to carry his food. At least a 21 to three week, four week voyage. An elephant, if you have to carry. See, there is a uh, carving of a giraffe on the Konark Temple. Giraffes are not found in India, so it is said that there was this Chinese admiral Zheng He, who took a. See, they also went came exploring. The Chinese had a bigger armada than the Spanish in the 1500s, in the 1400s actually. And they took a giraffe from Africa. He went because he was a Muslim. He took a. He went to Makkah, Medina. He took an Afri uh, a giraffe on a Chinese ship for the emperor to see. Ki aisa bhi janwar hota hai. This is recorded history. So we were building these boats much before the Brits and the Portuguese came into our waters. See, they came out of necessity. See, even today, I don't like continental food. It's got, it's so insipid. Uh, you can imagine what it must have been without the masalas of India. Right? And that's why they came, for the spices of India. But because of whatever our socio-political, geo, I mean, eco, you know, socio-economic structures and whatever, the rise and fall of empires, they saw opportunity and the British East India Company. You know, I saw a serial recently called Taboo. Uh, on Netflix, it's about the East India Company. I saw the first time I saw the flag of the East India Company. And, you know, they show in that serial, the chairman of the East India Company saying this dialogue. I noted it down. He says, the chairman of the East India Company made this statement. He says, we are richer than God. The East India Company is richer than God. And I blaspheme with impunity the chairman of the East India Company. That is the arrogance of the East India Company. And where did the wealth come from? From our country. They impoverished us. And this guy is talking like this, the chairman of the East India Company. You see that serial? They show us. I, first time I saw the flag of the East India Company. So this is what they did. Now, fine, they did whatever they did. Will we take responsibility for ourselves? See, what they did is half the story. What is the, what about the other half of the story? Aren't we responsible? So we need to tell the full story. What they did, what we did. And where we failed, we need to analyze. And not really repeat. See, the problem of history is we never learn history. And we never learn the lessons of history. And you are condemned to repeat it. You're condemned to repeat it. I would say, let there be an Aurangabad. Let humko khatak ne do, let there be a thorn there. Jo humko akharta hai always. Ki hum harate hain. Not because he was a great guy. And not because we lost, we were bad or cowards. But, see, let's not change history. Don't erase history. Try to resolve it, understand it, and learn the lessons of history. I mean, that's my view. Let's not get into it, but think about it for yourself. See, we need to understand our history, not just gloss over it and say everyone else was great. And see, have a nuanced view of history. 
have a nuanced view of history. History is his story. See, we keep glorifying everyone, then you don't learn anything. We are, they were all humans. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's uh, uh, my pleasure uh, to join you here and thank you, thank you for uh, such coming. a nice uh, interpretation of these uh, choke points across the globe. And as you said rightly, that uh, we need to uh, learn from our mistakes. So, like uh, I recommended uh, the book, uh, The Prisoners of Geography. Yeah, if, yeah. If, if, if people go through it, uh, history is written uh, to please the uh, people in power. Yes. Normally. <laughs> so the writers are always uh, state sponsored. <laughs> sponsored. So you will learn very little from the history. But if you learn the things like the presentation you made or book like Prisoners of Geography, we will learn a lot. What 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 is the potential? Like the way you ask the question whether we will be forty billion economy, forty trillion economy in next uh, 20, 30, 25 years. We should be definitely because every country got their thirty years. America got it from 1930 to 60, Japanese got 60 to 90, China got 90 to 20, and now 20, a little bit due to Corona, we got little little. Mm -hmm. But this 20 to 50 is the uh, our sweet spot. See, this is every they say now there's this very famous thing. Everyone gets his 15 minutes in the sun, in the limelight, right? So we are getting it now. What we make of it is on us. See, and mind you, Rishikesh is not going to be easy. At 18, look at all the problems they're creating for China. See, the rise of China is a threat. See, the rise of any nation, if you look at the history of the world, at the rise of empire, the rise and fall of empire. See, when someone rises, someone has to fall. How will it rise otherwise? So the rise of China is, threat is threatening to the world now, to the Europeans and the Western powers, right? So as we rise also, it's not going to be easy. You think they'll... I, I'm already reading articles in the international media that the Chinese have become a threat. Now, what if India rises? See, we are already already that Vishwa Guru is You think people want us to become Vishwa Guru? We want to become, yes. We have a Vasudev Kutumbakam. We are a peace-loving nation. We never went and conquered. See, if there are the, this Chinese diplomat who is the, the father of their foreign policy, Google who she, H U S H I, or S H E. He was a Chinese diplomat who was China's ambassador to Washington. He has written that the Indians didn't send a single soldier to China. We never sent a single soldier to China. But they have been Buddhists for the last 2,000 years. So say, you say, we don't want domination, right? What is this? Cultural domination or not? What is it? They say Buddhism is cultural domination. That's how the Chinese look at us. He says, you guys are dangerous. The Chinese feel we are the most dangerous guys in the world. Because what we say and what we do, there is no connect. Katni or Karni mein bohat farak hai. See, Bodhi Dharma was a Pallava prince. If you go into the history of Bodhi Dharma, the laughing Buddha and the guy who set up the Shaolin temple, he was a Pallava prince from the like modern day Tamil Nadu and Kerala. And he was an exponent of Ayurveda, Ayurveda and Kalaripait. The word karate comes from Kalaripait. And the Shaolin temple has been set up by this gentleman, Bodhi Dharma, from Pallava, a Pallava prince who saved Hinduism, Adi Shankaracharya who came from Kerala, right? Look at our history. We need to understand our own history. The problem is we don't have any good sense of history. Like Ma'am was telling me in the morning, he says our history teachers and our mathematics teachers are the most unfit teachers in our schools because of whom we never like history and we never like mathematics. See, we like subjects if we have a good teacher, right? So, but that's how it's taught to us. So whom do we blame? I mean, we are a collective to be blamed. So see, their perception about us is very different to our perception about them. They think, Allah, you guys have made us a Buddhist country for the last 2,000 years, and you are talking about imperialism, cultural imperialism. Hmm? Are we qualified, he says. He's asking me. He says, you guys, your prime minister went to uh, Bali. 
in 2000 now watch page went to bali in a air india plane called krishna devraya so i said so what i said where did you get this information you got the next time next day you got the india today international edition i said so what he says krishna devraya has ruled over bali and your prime minister goes in an air india plane called krishna devraya what does it mean here we come again this is how they view it see diplomacy the nuances of diplomacy are very different we feel it's a harmless simple thing it's not as simple as that so perception is everything i said that perception is reality at times you so firmly believe that this is what it is your perception is your reality i don't know i have answered your question or not <laughs> yeah yeah that's it thank you so much thank you so much for a patient hearing thank you all of you there online thank you so much thank you praful ji always it's very interesting to listen to praful ji and a very diverse perspective of things uh i want to request uh, that participants there is so much more to come uh today after this after the tea break we have a presentation on the uda digest platform which mrc runs it has more than 80 articles on different aspects of the uda or it represents the different dimensions of the uda uh now the uda digest is growing at the rate of almost 10 to 12 articles a month so two things i want to underline here that is the power of uda under water domain awareness it touches upon so many more dimensions and with every interaction we just learn that so many more dimensions we have not yet touched before lunch we had uh, people who attended they will know we had a, a, a presentation by vladimir rubin from paris he heads the intergovernmental ocean commission which determines now this is the decade of the ocean sciences declared by the un it is driven by the ioc and they have so many more plans and they are looking at india so differently but we indians are not taking it seriously so there is so much more to be done but my only request is we need more people to attend this i mean there is so much discussion going on there is so much to be looked at but if we don't take it seriously then who else can i mean there is so much i mean if you look at the entire spectrum of lectures that have happened so far ambassador mudgal has covered so many aspects he is part of the prime minister's blue economy committee which is now going to declare the blue economy uh, policy of this country so he gave a specific lecture on the blue economy opportunity challenges and opportunity itself then he talked about the larger diplomatic aspects then he also gave a different perspective today on the traditional knowledge and the various uh, issues uh, of msp he talked about so there is so much more to be looked at and we have tried our best if you look at the program to cover as many aspects because the first uh, workshop series is on policy now policy ma making is a very very complex task governance is a very complex task there are no straight answers to any questions that you can ask knowing learning from the past mapping it on the present and then looking at the future is not so simple many of us think that we look ahead but unless you know where you came from you can't plan your future and as praful ji repeatedly said we are a, i think we are a 10000 year plus old civilization and we are the only surviving civilization if i can say so we are the only continuity otherwise no other civilization has actually survived so if you have survived to survive in the nature i think is the most complex thing so there is so much value that we need to take and go forward but in for whatever reason there are geopolitical geostrategic reasons they have taught us to look at the west more than look at ourselves they have their vested interest that we have to understand so we had uh, dr radhika session in the morning and she made a very fantastic presentation so we wanted to plan this in a way even tomorrow we have a very very diverse set of lectures 
we have india's ambassador to uh, paris who was instrumental in design uh, uh, drafting the sagar vision of the honorable prime minister as part of the prime minister's office ambassador javed ashraf uh, um, anup mudgal sir you met uh, some time back he was in he was a ambassador of india to mauritius and javed ashraf sir was in pmo both of them together worked on it and that's how the prime minister went there and announced and sagar vision is a very very important declaration it has four tenets the first is that we recognize the security complexity and the security threats that exist in our waters it acknowledges the blue economic opportunities that exist in the indian ocean the third is we are conscious of the rich maritime heritage that we have and the fourth one is that we aspire to be a leader in the region this is the first apex level declaration in this country where we have talked about regional aspiration we are not talking about a national policy we are looking so that's a very different india that we are looking at so if our young people do not understand the future today the job that we are fighting for today will not exist in 5 years no i mean not just that uh, there's so much more uh, i mean we have to be agile and agility will come only when we have a broader sense of what is happening around us we can we if we don't plan for the future our next generation will find themselves completely unfit for the future <clears throat> welcome back we've had uh, this is our third day of the first workshop and i think we've had some absolutely fantastic uh, presentations and interactions with different experts and speakers and taking forward uh, we also want to bring on record that we have a digital platform called the uda digest where we are trying to create a repository of the articles which cover the different aspects of the uda framework so i wanted to request uh, nishtha vishwakarma our editor for uda digest to bring to this audience a detailed perspective on what this uda digest is and what are the kind of <coughs> information that is available in the uda digest so nishtha over to you i'll request you to kindly introduce yourself and then uh, make your presentation over to you uh first of all i would like to thank uh, mrc and anup sir for uh, allowing me this opportunity to to uh, share my thoughts on and my experience of handling the uda digest e magazine that came into force in the year 2021 so i am going to be using a presentation to support what i say so let me just share my presentation first yeah so hi everyone good evening uh thank you so much for joining us for the current ongoing workshop uh we're delighted to host you all for the workshop that mrc is conducting in collaboration with indo swiss center of excellence and ht parek foundation uh so yes uh, as i mentioned that i need to introduce myself i would like to introduce myself i am nishtha vishwakarma and i work at mrc as a communications lead and i'm also the editor of the uda digest e magazine uh so i started uh, working at mrc in the year 2022 in the month of uh, mid of january and uh, i i work on a lot of uh, communications and advocacy aspect of the organization i look after the summarizing the summarization bit of the publications and reports and other like uh, collaterals that goes out from mrc side on their website i also uh, like work with the communications team uh, which handles social media platforms and the website also so that's what i do and and i've participated in uh, some of the webinars that uh, mrc has hosted in the past and i've written reports on that so these are basic things that i do for the organization uh, okay so next what am i going to talk about today so today i'm going to be talking a bit about what uda is like my understanding Uh, as somebody who comes from the non technical background in this organization so i'll i'll talk about uh, my understanding of uda i'm also going to be talking about uda digest and various domains available under uda digest our achievements our experiences of handling an online e magazine etc so let's start journey 
So be- before I start, uh, uh, like uh, we delve deeper into the details, and uh, uh, I would like to share some uh, information about the workshop. So this workshop is actually being uh, like handled and is uh, is being conducted by Marcin Association with the Indo Swiss Center of Excellence and HD Parik Foundation. Uh, this four workshop series talks about institutionalized skilling ecosystem of Saga Vision based in the UDA framework. Uh, so till now, since the day the workshop started, we have mostly discussed the technical aspects of underwater domain awareness. Uh, during the workshop, uh, so this workshop is divided into like four series. The first series is going to be discussing about the polit- policy interventions. The second series is going to be discussing about the technology interventions. And the third series is going to be uh, discussing about the grassroots community engagement. And then in the fourth series, we are going to like sum up the entire workshop and all. Uh, I mean, all of this is uh, great. But uh, do you also know that, uh, and like Sir has already mentioned, that we, we run an e-magazine, which, which we call as uh, UDA Digest. Yes, uh, dear get delegates, we call it UDA Digest. So uh, before we get into what UDA Digest is, let's just discuss the initial as- like initial part of the UDA Digest, which is UDA. So what is UDA? Uh, let me give you a brief introduction about it. To answer your question, what UDA is, it is simply put, underwater domain awareness is an aspect of maritime domain awareness. Uh, that is focused on underwater sector and actually includes a wide range of interests and not just the military aspect of it. In more specific terms, underwater is basically the desire to know what is happening underwater in the maritime areas of underwater. Yeah, that's UDA. Next, what is UDA Digest? When did the journey begin? So uh, UDA Digest is a platform that allows uh, to bring us bring together diverse views and thoughts in the form of uh, short articles, videos, commentaries, creative posts, and more. UDA Digest began its journey in the year 2021 as a one-stop solution, destination for expert knowledge on underwater domain awareness, a concept that we've been pushing since the past few years now. Uh, Okay, and what about the key domains under the UDA Digest? Uh, uh, so before we get into the key domains of the Underwater Domain Awareness Digest that we run, I would like to acknowledge the contribution made by our key members who helped in taking the UDA Digest off ground. So I would like to thank Arohi Kaparia, Mrs. Ashwina Vakil, Mr. Rishabh Patra, and my dear colleagues Sridhar and Pranil and many more contributors uh, who, without whom this uh, platform wouldn't have existed. So thank you so much to all of them first. Yeah, so these are the various domains that we have uh, on UDA Digest. Uh, so, so we have uh, experts which, who write uh, for our platform on different domains. The first one is maritime security. We also have experts who write to us on uh, underwater archaeology, science and technology, de- geopolitics and IR, blue economy, sustainability and ESG, climate change, and uh, skilling ecosystem. So right now I'm going to be discussing about what kind of articles uh, have we had under the maritime security domain. So we had a number of articles written on our platforms on plethora of topics that come, that come under this theme called maritime security domain. Uh, some of the articles I've mentioned here, uh, we've had authors who've written an article on the Indian Ocean Region IOR and Underwater Domain Awareness Framework. Uh, we've had an article entitled India-Sri Lanka Relations and the BIMSTEC, a new perspective based on UDA framework. Uh, we've also had people write to us on the topic acoustic capacity and capability building in the tropical littoral waters of the Indo-Pacific strategic space. Uh, and there was a very interesting topic uh, on which uh, one of the authors had written about was China's underwater Great Wall project. Uh, quote unquote, implications, dissecting the threat and the possibilities. So uh, dear delegates, we've had all these articles written on our platform by great authors. And you can visit our uh, website, like I'm going to be taking you through the tour also, like I'll be making you tour the UDA Digest and I'll show you about the nitty gritties of, uh, you know, how the UDA Digest is run, what kind of articles are placed there. And then we'll be discussing a little bit about few of the articles which are available. Uh, next, uh, under the science and technology domain, we've had authors who have written articles on the following topics. 
uh, we've had uh, uh, somebody who's written an article on retrieving the ocean with artificial intelligence. Uh, then we have a very dear colleague uh, named Yukti. She's written articles on freshwater management, introduction to the do uh, domain, the UDA perspective. Uh, she also wrote an article entitled Water Quality Management Framework with the Sectoral Approach for India. Uh, then we have another colleague of mine uh, named Catherine. Like, uh, she has been writing articles on inland water waves too. Like, she's written a couple of articles on Indus, Indus Western Rivers. Uh, so the topic on which she wrote recently was Hydropower Race and Dispute Resolutions in Indus Western Rivers. So, yes, these have been some of the articles that people have written to us under the science and technology domain. Next, I'm going to be discussing about... Uh, the top, the kind of articles that people have written for us uh, under the geopolitics and IR domain. So the first topic that you see over here is something that I uh, contributed for the UDA Digest e magazine. It is creating awareness about the UDA amidst uh, G20 meetings. So like we all know, and it has been discussed in this meeting also previously, that India has taken over the G20 presidency from December 2022 onwards. And there have been various meetings that have happened you know, under India's G20 presidency on various topics, including uh, financial inclusion. There have been discussions around uh, uh, culture. There have been discussions around uh, all these topics. Like, And we've also had the foreign ministers meeting, which was uh, scheduled in the early uh, March, uh, on the sidelines of which, like, Quad uh, foreign ministers meeting was also held, wherein we, ha we saw participation from uh, the foreign ministers of Australia, Japan, uh, U.S. and, of course, like India's uh, Dr. S.J. Shankar was also part of it. And they did come out with a joint uh, statement on the same. So, um, so these, like, this is the reason why I thought that, you know, we should write an article uh, for uh, UDA Digest and we should cover the aspects of how UDA Digest can be a contributing factor in the G20 meeting. So, and the next uh, article that we've had... Uh, under the geopolitics and IR domain was Indo Water Treaty and Kashmir Conundrum, Water and Nationalism. Uh, this was again an article that Catherine had written. So, and the third one, uh, the next article that I would like to ex uh, like talk about under this was extreme weather conditions around the world as a result of climate change and how India and other nations are gearing up for it. Uh, like, and this is another article that I had written under this uh, particular domain. And I, uh, like, as we all know, like climate change is something which is like uh, on the tables uh, on like most of the international conferences that are going on. So writing articles on climate change is something that uh, we've made a separate domain altogether, wherein we are expecting the experts to write for us on climate change also. Uh, so very recently, like I've received an article from Dr. Swayam Prabha Das, like uh, she is an expert in this domain and uh, I'm still in the process of uh, assessing her article so that it goes on to the platform very soon uh, because uh, I feel like climate change is something that is being discussed not just like on the tables of uh, big conferences but on television, like in media, in newspapers, everywhere. So climate change is something that everybody is currently discussing and it becomes very important for all of us as well because uh, water also is being impacted due to the uh, concerns of climate change and all. Besides, uh, we've also had article written on uh, the Indian Ocean region, IOR, and the UDA framework. So yes, these were some of the articles that uh, people have written to us under the geopolitics and IR domain. Next, we also had articles for the underwater archaeology domain. We had two authors who had agreed to contribute, and the topics of those articles were as follows. Uh, regional overview of India's maritime heritage and uh, beneath the blue underwater archaeology in India. So, yes. Right now, I'd like to like talk about the kind of authors that we've had uh, who've written to us. Uh, so, uh, as part of the fellowships and internships at, uh, at MRC, it is compulsory for the fellows and interns to submit at least one article every month. Uh, and some of our fellows and interns who've written for us have been uh, my dear colleagues like Ananya, uh, Yukti, Catherine, We've had Aradhya, Sanskar. Sanskar just made a presentation in the morning on uh, marine spatial planning, and 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 he has been quite uh, like writing articles on the same topic uh, in the past as well. Shlok is also written, and we also have Rishika, 
uh, who is also like an in, like she's currently a fellow. She was an intern back then, and she's also been writing articles for us on various topics. So, yeah, so we have a good number of people and people from varied quality like backgrounds who have written articles for us. So when we receive an articles, uh, uh, dear delegates, we are not just focusing on the number of articles that we receive. We also very diligently focus on the quality of the content that is being provided uh, because that's that's what we would want to uh, like show. Next, uh, next is I would like to speak about the prominent authors and the prominent writers that we've had in the past who have written to us. Uh, first is, of course, uh, Dr. Commander Arnab Das. Third has been writing regular articles for UDA Digest every month. Like sometimes he submits two articles also. So, and, and, and like uh, these are some of the most read articles that Arnab sir has written. And we've had like good viewership of the articles that were there on the platform. His very recent article on ongoing strategic challenges and how SDGs along with the UDA framework can help. Another, like he's written articles on uh, Indian Ocean region, BIMSTEC, G20, etc. So uh, good thing about Sir's article, I've always feel is that they're very uh, relevant in the current scenario. They're very much uh, in line with the with the ongoing discussions on policies and topics and all. So, so that was one. Second, we've had Mr. Pratap M. Heblikar who has written for us. I'd, I'd like to talk about him. He's the former special secretary of the government of India, and he has held important and sensitive positions in the central government dealing with external security related issues. Uh, Mr. Pratap M. Heblikar in, wrote an article for UDA Digest entitled India-Sri Lanka Relations and the BIMSTEC, a new perspective based on the UDA framework. Next, we've also had Major General V.S. Ranade, who is, the, uh, who is from the Army Institute of Management, Kolkata. So Major General Ranade wrote an article entitled Sheer Sagar Manthan, Indian Ocean and Ocean of Decision. Major uh, Ranade wrote the, uh, that article, wrote in his article that Indian Ocean has always been important in the Indian history. And today it's the ocean that holds the power. Today it accounts for major shipping lanes and the flow of essential trade, which includes oil through the three choke points. So yes, uh, these are the kind of uh, like authors that we've had for the platform. These are the kind of topics that people have written uh, on when they talk about it. Next, I have a small question that how many articles do you think we have on our platform? Uh, so the correct answer here is 70 plus. Yes, uh, we have 70 plus articles written on our platform. And, and again, I would like to reiterate the fact that we're not focusing on the number of articles that we are receiving. We are very much interested in the quality of the articles that we receive on our platform. So yes, but, but we feel that it's a great achievement for an organization to have 70 plus article within a year and a half, uh, you know, and, and we are still, I still like have a uh, like couple of articles uh, there in my email and I have to assess and put it on the platform every month. Okay, so now that I've spoken about the kind of articles that we've had, the kind of speakers that we've had, sorry, the kind of authors that we've had uh, who've written for us, I would also like to talk about uh, like what are the key things that we expect the experts to keep in mind when they are uh, like drafting their articles. So. I've just mentioned two, I'm going to take you through a document, which is basically an SOP for writing an article for UDA Digest. So first year I've mentioned, keep your headlines conversational because uh, this is what I feel. I'll, I'll just share uh, the SOP right now. So yes, this is an SOP that uh, we've created and uh, these are the given that we expect from the, uh, the writers who write for us, we expect that the headline is concise and clear. So I ask my writers to ensure that the headlines of the articles are clear and concise. And I, I say that please skip writing the name of your subject or the topic of your internship projects, because uh, a lot of time we receive articles from the interns and the fellows also, and they kind of like take the subject or the topic of their fellowship and put it as the headline. So I, I always tell them to keep their headlines very catchy so that in the first shot, they're able to engage the readers. 
so and the word limit for our articles is that it should not be less than 1500 words but should not uh, exceed more than 25 to 3000 words i'm i'm going to be talking about way forward uh, in next few slides so there's something else that we've come up with uh, i always say that you connect your article with the current scenario uh, because it is always good to add current scenario and policy updates regarding your project in your article this gives an update to the uh, reader about what is going on in the policy domain next is uh, next is the paragraph uh, so sometimes i receive articles wherein uh, people like very high ranking people also they submit the articles but but the article is like in a straight go and it's always better to divide the article into paragraphs so i always ask uh, like the people who are writing for us to ensure that the articles are uh, divided the article is divided into paragraph because this helps to ensure the flow in your article and would also help you to establish successive points that you want to put forth next is give subheads like this is something like because when you when you break your article into paragraphs uh, you need to give subheads also so that people can associate with what is going to be happening in this particular color paragraph so this ensures that the reader uh, is able to connect to the subtopic also and not just the major topic which is given at the top i always uh, ask uh, re, uh, like the writers to add graphic graphics and illustrations also so i i tell them to please add graphics charts figures and images to add to your article so that it becomes more presentable and interesting also please mention the source of your figures yeah uh, we are uh, quite particular about this fact we we expect that wherever you are fetching uh, the images from wherever you are fetching a particular figure from please add the source to it so that we don't face any copyright issues in that matter uh okay this is a new thing like we we request them to share the images separately because it becomes easier for the website guy pranil to to have it uh, in the article then we also add a section in our article which is about the author which goes at the bottom of the article so we always request that please mention a line or two about yourself in your article at the bottom uh, because it goes in the about the author section and uh, uh, and and also in the like the web page of the uda digest i always request and this is something i've been requesting the authors to do that please highlight the important stuff please ensure that you highlight the important lines and important quotes of the ud digest article because you definitely want your reader to view your opinion about the topic the uh, the highlight text can go from 3 to 5 in numbers otherwise like i am the person who has to select what is important i'm sure like whoever is writing the article is in a better position to tell that yes this is what this part of my article is better and and these are the lines that i would really want my uh, reader to catch and all of that and uh, uh, so also like we've started with this new thing wherein we highlight the main things about the article at the top so we say that put down the key highlights of your article please ensure that the key highlights are script are crisp sorry so i'm going to take you uh, through how you like how this thing goes and and this is a format that we very recently come up with because a lot of time we know that authors do not have the time to go through the entire article so they can just go through the key highlights and see for themselves whether the article is uh, uh, you know interesting enough for them or not whether it is relevant enough for them or not so all these things have to be kept in mind so that is why and and i'd like to thank shridhar here because he was the one who suggested that we come up with something like this and becomes easier for the readers to to uh, kind of like understand from the for themselves whether this is right for them or not okay word format please i actually receive a lot of articles which are written in um, uh, like pdf format like they submit the articles to me in pdf format so so anybody who's planning to write an article for us i would just request that you share your articles in the word format because it becomes easier for me to uh, you know edit and make slight changes wherever required because there's a there's a way you know the articles are expected to be written i i check the flow i check uh, whether there's a like the grammar is in place whether there's a coordination between each of the paragraphs and all uh, you know whether the key highlights are there whether the important stuff has been highlighted or not so we so we expect uh, you know that you you share your article in the word format instead of sharing it in pdf format Uh, next i always request my uh, authors to double check the flow of the article and also if there are any grammatical mistakes so that your article is flawless uh, when to share mostly like we have uh, on a monthly basis we we accept articles from the writers 
and uh, like we have fortnightly uh, that is the frequency of how the articles goes out from mrc side so yes this slide was mostly about that points to keep in mind when you are drafting an article for udi digest okay next what next so all those who are interested and in, and who thought that uh, that through my presentation i was able to request you enough to start writing articles for us you can share your article with me uh, i'm the editor of the magazine so you can share it to me on nishtha.mrc@foundationforuda.in uh also like we'd like to announce that going ahead we are planning for longer articles on our platform uh and it, as it was part of the uh, uh, as it was part of uh, the sop also that your the minimum word limit is 1500 words and the maximum word limit is uh, uh 3000 words currently we are also like we are going to start that uh wherein we are ex expect uh, like expecting longer article and these uh, articles are expected to be like mini reports and the word limit for which would be 8000 to 10000 words we are yet to launch this section but we already have few authors working on the many reports uh, for ud digest yeah so key milestones uh, this is the journey that i've i've tried to put in this slide uh, ud digest began its journey from february march 2021 and like i mentioned and i acknowledge the contribution of the key members who took it off ground uh, once again like uh, congratulating and thanking all those who have worked really hard at the beginning including arohi including uh, ms vakil and and all so next uh, the year 2022 march 2022 is the year like is the time when i actually took up uh, uda digest magazine we started a campaign and started reaching out to more number of people uh, uh, like uh, this was a joint exercise that uh, arnab sir and i started doing like i was mostly doing it through emails we used to like uh, reach out to people and ask to write for us and all and sir also uh, got into a similar kind of activity uh, then by the year by the time it was october 2022 we had articles from prominent people like i've mentioned and there are more people like we we've, we've had uh, articles written to us from somebody who was in sri lankan government and and who was kind of like equivalent to the defense minister so so all these people have been writing for us uh, and by the time it was december 2022 the online magazine available which allows experts to share their views on uda we have by the time it was december 2022 we had 60 plus articles on our platform so i think this is how the journey has been and we create videos of the best articles available on the platform uh, so uh, like uh, we've had good number of like whenever we find that the quality of a particular article is really good what we do is we convert we take the script out of that and uh, we create a video out of that and and that's something i would like to commend uh, mehul and prathamesh for because these are the guys who actually work hard on creating videos out of uh, the Uh, uh like the articles so right now i'm going to take you through a tour of the uda digest yeah so dear delegates this is how the uda digest e magazine looks like uh these are the different domains under which we accept the articles uh like i said in the presentation before also it is maritime security blue economy sustainability esg and climate risk skilling india like these are some of like skilling and sustainability are basically the two new uh, domains that we've had it we've had work going on on these two topics but we never thought that we are going to create a separate platform for for the people to submit their articles on uh, we've had geopolitics and ir since before uh, since the beginning of the magazine then we have science and technology also under science and technology we have a different domain for inland waterways we like there are projects uh, that mrc does on two of the most important rivers uh, which is indus and brahmaputra so we have articles uh, written to us and we have uh, people like uh, ananya and uh, katherine who work on inland waterways and now we have yukti also who works on the same thing uh, yukti also handles the handles the fresh water management next we have underwater archaeology like i've told you i've mentioned about it so this is the most recent article that we have uh, which is entitled ongoing strategic challenges 
uh, and how SDGs along with UG, uh, UDF framework can help. So, and as you can see, this article has been authored by uh, Arnab sir. And uh, yeah, this is how the articles look like. So I'm going to be discussing about like what sir has written in this particular article. So sir says that people, economy, nature are the three inseparable components and policy makers need to find the right balance. He further says that ongoing conflict between Russia and Ukraine and the subsequent collapse of the supply chain and energy crisis has impacted the entire global economy. Now, uh, Sir has also mentioned that UDA framework by design encourages pooling of resources and synergizing of efforts across the stakeholders. He further notes that UDA framework builds efficiency in resource utilization and optimizes the governance mechanism. He says that developing nations are struggling to prioritize the socio-economic requirements and thus not able to invest as long-term sustainable development goals. So these are the key highlights that I was talking about, um, audience. Like, uh, this is uh, the place where which actually captures or does not capture the reader's attention. And uh, these are the key highlights. Like, uh, the important area is highlighted in blue like this, like the one which has been mentioned here. Next, sir has talked about like various SDGs and their realization through UDA framework is discussed. He has spoken about like all the SDG, SDG 1, 2, 3, 4, and uh, the ones on clean water uh, and sanitation, affordable and clean energy. Yeah, and this is uh, basically the uh, infographic that has been made uh, about the article so all these things goes into UDA digest and yes this is the section wherein we mention about the author so whenever you're writing about yourself it goes into the section and we we give full credit to the author so yeah this is how the article is written next I would like to discuss about an article on climate change uh, so yeah, this is an article that I wrote and I wrote it because it was quite relevant at that time because of all the all the weather conditions and all and there were like fire, forest fires happening and all these things were happening at that time. So extreme weather conditions around the world and the result of it, how India and others are gearing up. So in this article, I'd spoken about how, you know, nations, which are the major nations who have contributed towards uh, global warming mostly and uh, how extreme weather conditions in India have been and how is India coping up. So in this article, I've, I've mentioned about like uh, sta some states like I've written after suffering intense heat waves in April 2022, states like Assam, Nagaland and Bihar received too much rainfall. And on the other hand, Jharkhand received almost half of what was due in it. So in 2021, some scientists from the Ministry of Earth Sciences revealed a sharp rise in extreme weather events in India in the past 50 years. So I've spoken about all these things. I've also mentioned about what uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi had said during the COP26 summit, in, which was held in Glasgow, UK. So he had set a five-point agenda for India, which would try to keep it on the path of maintaining decorum when it comes to ha handling climate change. He said that India will take its non-fossil energy capacity to 500 uh, gigawatt by 2030. Uh, the next promise was that India will meet 50% of its energy requirement from renewable energy by 2030. He further stated that India will reduce the total projected carbon emissions by 1 billion tons uh, from now till 2030. 30. He further said that by 2030, India will reduce the carbon intensity of its economy by less than 45%. He also said that by 2070, India will achieve the target of net zero. So these were the instances that I put of uh, extreme weather conditions in other countries, like how forest fires were happening in various countries, including Spain, France, China, Turkey, everywhere. Uh, and how international institutions are trying to cope with uh, extreme weather adversities like uh, institutions and, and, and like places like and all. Article had also mentioned about the underwater domain awareness framework. How does it help in climate change thing? So yeah, this is how like the articles are written on our platform. Uh, we've also had articles written on sediment bearing pressure analysis using using sediment classification 
We've had articles written on Indian Ocean region and the underwater domain awareness framework. Uh, people like I mentioned about Catherine's article on Indus Water Treaty, water and nationalism. So this is what uh, like one of our fellows, Catherine, has written. He says that since the inception of the Indus Water Treaty, Pakistan continual objection to project on projects on the western rivers have had serious impact on the political economy of Jammu and Kashmir. She further says that it is critical to examine post-partition events in order to comprehend the political and developmental complications in Kashmir. She also noted that water nationalism has grown in recent years as the supply-demand gap in India and Pakistan has widened. Uh, yeah, that was Catherine sharing her thoughts via uh, uh, UDA Digest. So, yeah, so these are like some of the present, like these are some of the articles that we've had on our platform. Uh, thank you so much. That's all that I would like to uh, share with you regarding UDA Digest. But before I conclude, I would also like to like uh, in January this year in 2023, we completed uh, like 60 plus articles and we came out with a video. You must have been viewing that. Uh, during the tea breaks also. I'd like to play the, right now that we've ended this uh, particular video, uh, sorry, this uh, particular presentation, I would like to play the video as well. So I hope you like it. The genesis of the UDA Digest was to provide a platform to present the multiple dimensions of the UDA framework. The two-year-old platform has come a long way in generating the body of work to demonstrate the wide spectrum of stakeholders, disciplines, applications, dynamics, and more. Underwater domain awareness, UDA, in simple terms, is a desire to know what is happening underwater. The Indian Ocean region, IOR, is of immense strategic importance. Countries in the Indian Ocean region vary in many areas, including economic development, demography, ethnic and sectarian issues, relations with neighboring countries, and more. These challenges are compounded further by the actions of the extra-regional powers. India, as the lead player in the IOR, has a lot at stake. The key is in capacity and capability building. We need pooling of resources and synergizing of effort at national and regional level India must take a lead role in driving underwater domain awareness to realize this vision. UDA Digest has emerged as a platform that is willing to give space to quality content so that we can deliver in a simple way. Hi, I'm Nishtha and I am the editor of the UDA Digest e -Mac. Ever since I took over as the editor of the magazine, I've only seen exponential increase in the leadership of the magazine. Some of the domains under which we expect our experts to write for us are Blue economy, underwater archaeology, geopolitics and IR, science and technology, maritime security, marine environment, and so on and so forth. Become a part of our UTA Digest community to dive into an underwater adventure coming to your inbox every month. Oh, that's it for my end. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Nishta. So <clears throat> that's the UTA Digest and. Uh, I think we at MRC are very proud of it because in the long run, it will have the repository of so much information. Uh, the present form is not uh, about very deep uh, uh, and scientific uh, articles, but it is more of knowledge dissemination uh, to the larger audience. Uh, so uh, we request the author uh, to give a more simplistic explanation to what the aspect they are trying to cover. But as Nishta also mentioned, now we are getting into the next version of it. Uh, another section is getting added where we'll be talking about uh, more serious and in-depth uh, articles with a lot of references and also there will be 10,000 word long short reports as we will be calling it. So Catherine and Nishta are working on that and I think in the next couple of months, that will also uh, get activated. And we already have a few uh, authors who have agreed to write. <coughs> Our own fellows will also be uh, contributing to it. So we are quite uh, excited about that. And uh, we want to be, as MRC, we want to uh, 
become a nodal center for driving the underwater domain awareness. And we are definitely making sincere effort. Nishtha, thank you so much. Uh, the UDA Digest platform is certainly a very, very important platform for us. And through your presentation, we would like to reach out and also encourage more and more people to get associated and contribute to the UDA Digest. Thank you so much. Thank you. So thank we you. will end the day now. Uh, we will, <clears throat> for tomorrow, there is a very good lineup of speakers. As uh, today, we had uh, three very, very exciting presentations, very, very, very eminent people, starting with Dr. Radhika Shah, that's a, the, uh, Radhika session. That was an absolutely different perspective that she brought, and so very important perspective. Then we had uh, Dr. Vladimir Rubin from UNESCO, <coughs> head of the Ocean uh, Intergovernmental Ocean Commission, which is driving the UN Decade of the Ocean mission and also sanskar who presented his work on marine spatial planning and then of course after lunch we had uh, shri praful talera talking about the choke points so tomorrow we have an equally interesting lineup we have uh, dr ne uh, neha midha uh, joining us from the <coughs> unesco india we have uh, ambassador gunatilake or Ambassador Jawad from uh, Sri Lanka talking about the small island uh, nations, the challenges and opportunities. And then we, of course, have Ambassador Jawed Ashraf making a presentation on the Sagar vision because he was the key person behind the uh, <coughs> initiative. So we'll end for the day and we'll request uh, as many participation tomorrow because tomorrow is also in a very, very equally important day. Thank you very much.